بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ وصلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ مباد اعود باللہ سمیع علیم الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم یا ایوہ الدین آمن اد خلف السلم کا فہ ولا تطبع خطوات شیطان ان لکم عدو مبین وقال رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم علیکم بسنتی و سنت الخلفاء الراشدین المحدین من بعدی او کما قال علیہ صلاۃ السلام Respected brothers and sisters, it is a privilege for me to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of my ability and I have been invited to address a very important topic today. Um, the, the topic is Hadith rejection, why, where and who or why where, when, and who. So, it is a modern phenomenon in its current form, but it has existed. The, the, the precedent was established long ago. Let me explain first what this rejection is. Am I speaking in English or Urdu? Usually this class is in Urdu or English? Usually this is in English. It's in English. So, everyone who is attending right now understands English. English is better because it goes out, goes out to a wider audience, inshallah ta'ala. So I'll stick to English for now. And if I need to explain something in Urdu, I'll try my best to do so. So before I continue with the topic, I would like to apologize for the delay. My father had given me a task. Um, so I was busy fulfilling that task. And I was perfectly aware of this responsibility as well, that I had to come and deliver this lecture. But my father's task takes precedence over anything else in my life. This is the way I see it. The rights of parents, you know, they take precedence over anything else in life. So this is why I was delayed because I had no other choice, unfortunately. But I'm here now. So uh, the topic is very important one because this phenomenon called Inkare Hadith or inkar al-hadith in the Arabic language or hadith rejection or rejecting hadith has emerged in the Muslim world generally and specifically in Pakistan more so than anywhere else because this is where it was, it was born in the recent uh, times. Inkar al-hadith or rejecting hadith whatever form it may come in was started by primarily the first sectarian group in Islam. Who knows what the first sectarian group in Islam is? In the history of Islam, the first sectarian div uh, 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 digression or a group that separated itself from the Muslim main body. You said Shia. Okay, Kharijites or the Khawarij. Anyone else? Okay, anyone else? Okay, yes, the sisters are correct. The Khawarij were the first sectarian group in the history of Islam. And this is what the ulama has stated. People like Imam Shahrastani in his book Al Milal Wan Nihil, uh, uh, he has documented the history of the Khawarij and how they came about uh, and the topic today is not to discuss the Khawarij but to highlight this point that they were the first ones to break away from the main body of Muslims. So first there was Islam, what we call the normative Islam or Islam as it was delivered by the Prophet ﷺ to his companions and then came digression going away from that path people who broke away from the main body of muslims who were the main body of muslims at the time of the prophet sallallahu the prophet and his companions they were the people who took knowledge directly from the prophet sallallahu and this is the core of islam this is where you need to understand how to follow pure islam if you want to follow pure Islam, the core of pure Islam is the Prophet 
and the people who learned directly from him. You go to anyone else for Islam or to learn your Islam, to understand your Islam, you will go astray. You will fall in error, guaranteed. And anyone who studies the history of Islam, which I happen to have done to the best of my ability, I'm a student of history. I've come to realize that anyone who breaks away from the way of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ ended up in dalal, in misguidance. Because that was the main body of the Muslims in the early days of Islam. They are the ones who received the Quran, understood it directly from the Prophet ﷺ and delivered, delivered it in a perfectly pure form to their followers. Anyone who breaks away from them or finds a fault in them or tries to make, make excuses to put them in bad light has simply gone astray. And it is a challenge. You may find individuals here and there going astray, even among the companions of the Prophet <coughs> But the main body of the companions who numbered over a hundred thousand over a hundred thousand people, men and women, they stuck together to preserve the Quran and the prophetic tradition, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And in history, anyone who sticks to the followers of prophets prospered. They never went astray. And anyone who broke away from them simply, you know, um, found themselves in error. Very quick example. I had a recent debate in the US um, nearly 10 days ago or almost two weeks ago. I was in America, in the, U uh, in the USA, Atlanta. I had a debate with a Christian scholar there on the issue of salvation by the cross. Do we need the cross for salvation as the Christians claim? The Christian belief is that Jesus Christ, Isa salam, was crucified he died on the cross to liberate humanity. To, he died for our sins. And he lifted the curse of the law. Now, was this idea, this doctrine, or this aqidah, was it preached by Isa alayhi salam? Did Isa preach this? No. When you open the Bible, even in its current form, which is altered, it is in uh, the, even the New Testament. Forget about the Old Testament. That's a completely different story. Even the New Testament, the Gospels and the writings of other uh, authors, even in their current form, when we read the words of Isa alayhi salam or the words attributed to him or the Hadith of Isa alayhi salam, if you want to put it that way, there is nothing in the words of Isa alayhi salam where he might have said that I was sent to be crucified on the cross so that I can expiate for your sins or I can ransom, I can present myself as a ransom for your sins or I can be a redemption for you or I will be a source of your salvation by dying on the cross. The question is, who preached that idea is the question. Who preached that idea? If Isa salam didn't do that, if he didn't come up with this idea, redemption by the cross or salvation by the cross, just believe in the cross and you will have salvation. You will have salvation. You don't have to do any good, good works. Who taught that idea? Anyone? Anyone? If Isa al-Islam didn't teach that idea, where did the Christians get it from? Paul. They call him Saint Paul. Right? Paul, another man who never met Isa al-Islam. Yes. All were. All of them were. All. Yes. Yes, the details are far too much for us to go into. Again, we're going to turn this lecture into a, history, a lecture on the history of Paul. But Paul was the man who came up with this idea. 
Paul, who never met Isa a.s. Never met Jesus. And then after Isa a.s. disappeared, he was lifted up, as we are told in the Quran. And even in the, in the Old Testament, there's a prophecy about the Messiah, the Messiah or the Messiah being saved. In the book of Psalms, chapter 91, the entire chapter is talking about the Messiah being saved. He will not be hurt. He will not be killed. He will simply, the angels will lift him. Allahu Akbar. It's in the Old Testament. It's a prophecy. And the Quran confirms it. In the middle, we have this religion called Christianity. And this religion is not based upon the teachings of Isa a.s. Rather, it is based upon the doctrines Paul preached to the followers of Isa a.s. later on. Paul came up with this idea that Isa a.s. died for our sins. And we don't have to follow the Jewish law anymore. We are free from the law. The Jews, their life was the law, the Mosaic law, following the Torah. And this idea to them was abhorrent. How can someone come along or come and, and say that we don't have to follow the law? And Isa a.s. is thought to have taught in the Gospel of Matthew that law must be followed. A man came to him asking him that, um, how do I get eternal life? How do I get success? Falah. You know, Qad aflah al mu'minun. The Quran tells us the successful are the believers. Similar question was put to Isa alayhi salam. How do we succeed? How do we get eternal life? Success in the hereafter. Isa alayhi salam said, follow the commandments. In other words, follow the law of Musa alayhi salam. Right? And the list goes on and on. And then there are more details. He said, I also do that. I already do that. Then Isa alayhi salam said, okay, sell your property and dedicate your life to Allah and his messenger. That is Isa alayhi salam. And he said, that's very difficult for me to do. And he turns, he, he walks away. So Isa alayhi salam taught the importance of law. Paul comes along and he goes, Isa alayhi salam has died on the cross. And that sacrifice was for, for you to be freed from the law. So you don't have to follow the law anymore. Just believe in the sacrifice. Just believe that Isa alayhi salam died for your sins on the cross. You will have salvation. Now, the companions of Isa alayhi salam had a problem with Paul because of this. And even in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we are given incidents where the direct companions, Ashab, Ashab al-Rasul, yani the companions of Isa alayhi salam, his hawariyun, his, his supporters, those who spent time with him, learned from him, and were teaching his message to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. One of them was James, James, who became the leader of the, the, the followers, followers of Isa alayhi salam in Jerusalem. When Isa alayhi salam disappeared, he left behind companions, right or wrong? Yes, his companions didn't go away, they stayed there. So they were teaching the Jewish people in Jerusalem and they continued to go to the Kaaba. What was the Kaaba? <laughs> Masjid al-Aqsa, the Temple of Solomon, right? The Temple of Solomon, which was destroyed in 70 CE by Titus, the Roman uh, general. But at this time, Isa al Islam disappeared. His companions continued to worship there. So they had a problem with Paul. So they lectured Paul and they went against Paul and they rebuked for Paul for allegedly preaching against the law. And then when Paul came in front of them, uh, James told Paul to go and worship in the temple and sacrifice in the temple so the people can see that they are lying about you that you are preaching against the law but Paul was in fact preaching against the law but Paul like a hypocrite went to the temple and sacrificed and did the rituals so he deceived people against what he actually believed to either save his life or for some other end right so the point is most Christians today, if not all, actually follow Paul at the expense of following Isa alayhi salam. Why? Because they left the way of the Sahaba of Isa alayhi salam and they followed another man who came after Isa alayhi salam and he said, I have the true message of Isa alayhi salam. I have a revelation now and I had this vision of Isa alayhi salam on the road to Damascus and he told me all these things and now things have changed. Everything Isa alayhi salam taught is gone. Subhanallah, false prophet. 
false prophet. Just like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani came and he said, I have this revelation. And he was asked, what, what is the angel called? And he said, Tichi. <laughs> His angel was called Tichi. Right? He was asked, what's the name of the... <laughs> right? So, even from the stories, you know, this is just ajeeb, this is strange, right? So, he came up with these theories that I'm also a prophet. Okay, I didn't bring a new Sharia, but I'm a prophet. And then people started to follow him because they left the way of the Sahaba. What did the Sahaba do to false prophets? They fought them. Why? Why did the Sahaba? If there was room for another prophet after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Sahaba would have said, "Okay, hold on a second. Yeah, of course, there is room in Islam for other prophets." Like the Qadianis argue, they argue, right? There is room for a prophet. That's why Mirza Ghulam Muhammad Qadiani, his prophethood is uh, valid. If that was the case, why did the Sahaba go out and go through so much trouble in suppressing the movement of Musaylimah al kadhab Aswad Ansi, and whoever other people came along and claimed to be false prophets? Uh, Mukhtar al takafi al kadhab Why is he called Mukhtar al takafi al kadhab Why? Because a liar. So the Sahaba, their way is very important. Anyone who broke away from their way, from their tradition, simply went astray. And this is what happened to the Khawarij, the first group in Islam who broke away from the way of the Sahaba. And they started to condemn the Sahaba. They made takfir of Muawiyah, and they made takfir of Ali bin Abi Talib, and they said these people are misguided, and we are guided. And they had excessive taqwa. Their taqwa was excessive. To an extent where Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu an, he went to their um, the camp and you know when you go close to a beehive, what do you hear? Buzzing. You know the buzzing sound? Mm, that buzzing sound, like when your mobile phone vibrates. Huh? That sound. When you go close to the beehive, Abdullah bin Abbas, he said, when I went to the camp of the Khawarij, I heard this buzzing sound. And what was that sound? Them reading the Quran. Them reading the Quran, but their understanding the Quran was so accurate in their eyes that they started to tell Ali bin Abi Talib, the man who was promised Jannah by the Messenger of Allah وسلم, that your understanding of the Quran is wrong. Ali would deliver khutbas on the member in Kufa and the Khawarij would stand up and they would say, your understanding is wrong. You have misunderstood the Quran, Allahu Akbar. And these people never met the Prophet. Most of them were not Sahab. They, not, not, not one Sahabi was found among them. So we have youngsters like that today. MashaAllah, they come to Islam two, three months, read one or two pamphlets or books here, and they start to implement Sharia on every single person who comes along. Yeah? They start to look down upon their family, their aunties, their uncles. Oh, right? Right? We, you know, this attitude was there. So Khawarij came up with these theories and they started to come up with new theology, new ways of interpreting the Sunnah of the Prophet. So they were the first ones to reject the Hadith of the Prophet, the Sunnah of the Prophet, or to cast doubt on, because they came up with these ideas. Like there is a Hadith in Bukhari that a woman came with uh, to Aisha radiallahu anha. And she came up with this idea of uh, about fasting and kafara of fasting. And she came up with this erroneous idea that do we not have to make up for our, uh, you know, um, for example, during menstrual cycles, you know, making up for fast. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked her, a haruriya anti, a haruriya anti, are you one of the khawarij? They were known, known as haruriya. Harura was a place in Iraq where the Khawarij came from. So they had already emerged with their new theology and they broke away from the way of the Sahaba. They thought they know better, right? Then came the Mu'tazila. This is the early history of the rejection of Hadith, where this idea came from. Mu'tazila. Um, Hassan Basri, the, the term Mu'tazila comes from a statement Hassan Basri, who was one of the greatest Tabi'een, uh, made in this regard are, you know, now a mu'mine, now a kafir. They are hanging in the middle. They stand somewhere in the middle. Their status is undecisive. 
Hassan Basri, when he heard this, he said, Iqtaziru. They have gone away. They have left the main body. Because this belief cannot be substantiated in the, in the light of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. There, there are people hanging in the middle as well, right? This is a Catholic concept. The limbo, the concept of limbo, right? So we don't believe in that. We believe people who commit major sins are believers, but they are sinners. And if they repent, Allah will accept the repentance. And if they don't repent, they will pay for it in Jahannam. And then they will be eventually taken out. They will not remain in hellfire. How do we know this? From the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, from the Sunnah. So Mu'tazila were a people who used their rationality over the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Where did, this, where did this movement come from? When Greek works were translated into the Arabic language in the 9th century CE or the 2nd century Hijri, uh, some of the Greek works written by Greek philosophers such as Aristotle, uh, Plato, and other thinkers, they were translated into the Arabic language. And then Aristotelian logic, which is based upon skepticism that you everything is guilty until, until proven otherwise. Everything is guilty. You have to question everything, right? So, and these people came to be known as rationalists. So they used their rationality to judge every single ayah of the Quran or the hadith of the Quran and that's why a lot of them went astray a lot of a lot of them went astray so what does this experience teach us that rationality is limited it is very limited your akal what we call akal um, is not over knuckle knuckle is the text of the Quran and the Sunnah right Akal is under the knuckle because knuckle is the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah revealed the Quran, right? So Allah knows best. He is the creator of the heavens and the universe. He tells us in the Quran that He is the one who created Badiyu Samawati wal Ard wa Ida Qada Amran fa inna yakulu lahu kun fa yakun. Okay, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is he's the one who created the universe, uh, the heavens and the earth. So he is supremely wise supremely wise he is ultimate ultimately wise right we all of us put together all the humans on the planet and other species beyond if they do exist cannot possibly outdo allah's wisdom can we if you can then produce your evidence allah has created the heavens and the earth what have you done allah tells you in the quran of mankind and jinn you get together you cannot produce a fly. Yes? You can make a fly. You can create a fly. You can create flying jets. Right? But self-sustaining maki. Which is the fuel that is Maki is a fly. Right? It has its own system. You cannot, you cannot create a fly. And then Allah says, if it takes away something from you, agar koi maki tumse kuch le bhi jaye, tum usse wapis nahi la sakte. When, when a fly comes and sits on your food, ab usko adate ho, it's taken something from the food, right? You cannot bring it back. <laughs> maki se kuch wapis la ke dekhao mujhe. Challenge hai. Maki ko maar sakte ho aap. You can, you can plan, but you cannot bring, the, bring back that food. If it takes, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching you lessons. How little you are. You have, or you Allah ko challenge karte ho. You stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ni ye kyun ki, Allah ni ye kyun ki, why me, why this, why that? Who are you? What's, what's your status in comparison to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what He has created? From the day you are born till the day you, are, uh, you die, you rely on Allah's mercy. If Allah took away mercy from your mother's heart, you wouldn't even survive. Imagine if your mother didn't clean you for five days. When you were a baby. When you were in your nappies, when you were urinating and you were you know, defecating and leaving that mess. Imagine, you know, have you seen animals? Allahu Akbar. Animals. When animals give birth, the baby gets up and starts walking. A goat. Have you seen a goat? Little goat? It goes straight for the milk. 
It goes straight for the milk as if it has pre pre-programmed knowledge that that's where you need to go. You want to survive? As soon as you come out, you go for milk. Human babies, you leave them on the bed. You put the mother next to them. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. They, they don't know where to go. They will die if the mother doesn't lift them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you. If Allah didn't put that mercy in your mother's heart. So the point is that rationality, human rationality, human, human, human intellect, human knowledge, human life, human ability is all limited. It's all limited by your conditioning, your circumstances, and your environment. Do you agree? People who have lived in Pakistan all their life, you don't think like Gore, do you? Do you think like Gore? And if you bring Gore here to live here, they don't think like you because they have different circumstances, different conditioning, different ability to understand different things in different ways. Yes? Hmm? So this is why human rationality is conditioned. It is influenced. So it cannot be used as an objective anchor to govern your lives because when human rationality is conditioned, it will do things in a very subjective way. For example, all humans know alcohol is bad. It's bad. Yes, it is bad. How do we know it's bad? Not, not because you get drunk and you fall around. No, no, no. What it does to the society. Most violence in the West is directly linked to alcohol consumption. People are drinking and they kill each other. The crimes are on the weekend, but in the world, they don't have a whole week. People are working in the whole week, from 9 to 5, they are busy. They go home and sleep. They come out on the weekend, they drink and drink and they kill each other. Right? So this is how life is there. And everyone knows alcohol is bad, but why is it not banned if it's bad? Because everyone is conditioned to think it's okay. It's a necessity of life. It goes. And the people who are making laws are never going to ban alcohol, even though they know it's bad. Why? Because human life, or sorry, human intellect is conditioned by circumstances. And circumstances are what in the West? Everyone is drinking. So drinking is part of the culture. How can we outdo, how can we actually ban it? Even though it's so evil, it's so bad. So human intellect is actually conditioned. So we cannot use human intellect, which is limited. Yes, no doubt Allah has given us enough intellect to know the right and the wrong. Yes, Allah has given us enough intellect to understand Islam and Allah's commandments. But Allah has not given us enough intellect to outdo or veto Allah's commandments. Because Allah's wisdom is ultimate. Allah tells you, do not touch intoxicants. Do not touch intoxicants. Whether it is wine, whether it is charas, cocaine, heroin, whatever it is, it destroys you. Haram, Haram is one thing, but then Allah goes further. Fajtani buhu. Do not go close to it. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu inna mal khamru wal maysaru wal ansabu wal azlamu rijsum min amal shaytan fajtanibuhu fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihoon Agar tum falah chate ho if you want success do not go close to these things. Touching is don't go close. So this is Allah's wisdom. Allah's wisdom is telling us don't do these things. And human intellect says, oh, jane do, jane do, chalne do, chalne do. And then what, see what happens in societies. So this is why we cannot use human intellect, rationality to outdo Allah's commandments or the sunnah of the Prophet That's why aqal naqal ke tabe hai. Not the other way around. Your naqal is not, you know, based upon aqal. Yes, to understand naqal, you need aqal, no doubt. Right? But you need aqal. Akal which is in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know your limits 
and despite knowing your limits you use your intellect which, which has been given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to you in a limited amount so that you can have enough akal to understand what he has sent down and act upon it and that's why you will be judged based upon your akal how you used it so rationalists the Mu'tazila were the first people who came up with these ideas that they started to reject the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and started to come up with new ideas, uh, you know, man ghadat, you know, self, uh, self-serving interpretations of the Qur'an. So Mu'tazila, they came up with these ideas and they started to come up with ideas like Qur'an is created, Qur'an is created. Qur'an jo wo makhluk hai. And then some ulama were tortured. Some of these Mu'tazila, the rationalists in the early history of Islam, they influenced Khulafa. Some of the Khulafa of Banu Abbas, they became Mu'tazila. Starting from Mamun. Then, you can listen to it afterwards, inshallah. Then, uh, first Mu'tasim Billah, sorry, Mamun, then Mu'tasim, then Wathiq and then Al Mutawakkil who repented. Three Khulafa of Banu Abbas were influenced by a Mu'tazili scholar called Ahmad bin Abi Dawood, who had convinced these Khulafa that the Quran is created and this is a doctrine you have to pump out and you have to force the ulama to accept this doctrine, otherwise the Ummah will be destroyed in their view. Right? So ulama were tortured. Some of them tortured to death. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal was tortured. Imam Abu Hanifa died before that, the fitna. Imam Abu Hanifa died in 150 uh, Hijri. And this was before the fitna erupted to a scale when Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal was tortured. So, this is what happened. Imam Ahmad was forced. In fact, Muhtasim Billah, he asked Imam Ahmad to be brought out of prison because he was imprisoned. And then in front of the Khalifa, he was beaten. Imam Ahmad, he was a very thin man, a very, very weak man physically, but spiritually he outweighed the, the Abbasid Empire. You know the Romans, Mu'tasim Billah, you know Mu'tasim Billah, go and study his history, Romans were paying him tax. Yani Banu Abbas ki itni badmashi thi, ke Rome jasi badi taqat was paying them tax to keep them you know, just the way we taxes today. We give big countries, right? We have a joke in the We are also giving jizya. We do, we, we pay jizya. Like other people, back in the day, Muslims used to receive jizya. Now we are, we are paying jizya. Every Pakistani child, every child who is born in Pakistan is in debt. Right? So the point is, Romans were so powerful that and Banu Abbas, think about Banu Abbas who were receiving taxes from Romans. And Mu'tasim Billah was the most powerful man in the world, without a doubt. He was the most powerful man, the richest and the most powerful man in the world. Mu'tasim Billah, the Khalifa of Banu Abbas. And Imam Ahmad was brought in front of him. He said, why don't you accept the doctrine of Khalqul Quran? He said, what? Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, give me something from the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet and I will accept it. If you do not have something clear from the Quran or the Sunnah, I cannot accept it. Then he was lashed, he was beaten. In fact, people were executed in front of him to terrorize him. And there's an incident, Abu Hassan al Nadwi, Rahmatullah, in his book, Tariqh, Dawat, or Azimat, he, he narrates an incident that Imam Ahmad wants. He, two men were executed in front of him to terrorize him and he turns to the man sitting next to him and asks him what was the opinion of Imam Shafi'i about wiping over socks? Can you think, think about it? Yeah? Someone is, has been executed in front of him and you've been, you've been told that you will be next. You will be next. And you go, okay. What was the opinion of Imam Shafi on socks? He's so... That scholar Ahmad bin Abi Dawood who was watching, the man who influenced these Khulafa, he said, look at this man. He has no fear in him. He has no fear in him. Because they believed in the Quran. Allah <laughs> 
This is what they believed in. That those who say Allah is my Rabb and then they are firm on that. Then angels come upon them and tell them do not fear, do not grieve because Allah has promised you Jannah and he will give it to you. So the rationalists came up and they caused a lot of fitna and the, and the ulama, people like Imam Ahmad and Hanbal and Muhaddisin, they stood against them intellectually, challenged them intellectually to prove their case from the Sunnah of the Prophet or leave it and then they were defeated. After the Mu'tazila, the fitna of Inkarul Hadith did not emerge in the Muslim civilization throughout the history of Muslim civilization. It was suppressed throughout. The sacrifices of the ulama in the second century Hijri and the hard work against the Mu'tazila, their writings, their books, their arguments, their debates, their uh, you know, uh, speeches and their teaching sessions did the job. The people of the tradition became well established. And this is a side point I would like to mention very quickly that the scholars of Islam, the tradition, the traditionalists, the traditionists, because they were the people of tradition, we call them traditionists in the English language, but in the Arabic language they were called muhaddisin. The scholars of hadith, the scholars of tradition, they were not against progress. Progress. They were not against science. They were not against uh, Muslims becoming strong and powerful, whether it was militarily or technologically or financially or in any other way. They were against blind skepticism of Aristotle. They were against Aristotelian logic that eventually leads to kufr if it is not controlled. So they were not against science or Greek science or Indian science for that matter. They were against specifically Aristotelian logic which was based upon extreme skepticism which leads to belief, disbelief sorry. So after the suppression of this fitna of Inkar al-Hadith in the 2nd century. What comes now? In the 19th century, the fitna rises again in the Indian subcontinent. Out of all places, the Indian subcontinent. Bare Sagheer, this is Bare Sagheer or Shibhul Qar al-Hindiya in the Arabic language. This is where the fitna arose again. And the scholars have pointed out a number of individuals uh, who started the fitna. Number one, the name that comes to mind or the top of the list uh, is Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, who was very prominent in initiating the in independence movement also. He was the first person to come up with the idea that we need a separate homeland for the Muslims in India. Because he could see that Muslims are very inferior in administrative skills. Muslims, because they didn't want to, they, 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 Muslims basically uh, bore the brunt of the, uh, the, the, the wrath of the British Empire. After the 1857 War of Independence, jab hui, to uska sara malba, sara ilzam musulmano par gira. Halake wo jang, johe wo hindu ne shuru ki thi. Hindus started the rebellion in a place called Meerut, a Hindu contingent of soldiers. They started the conflict with the British uh, soldiers and they killed few British soldiers. Uh, and the person who started the movement or this rebellion was called Mangal Pandey. Um, he started the, the movement and he was a Hindu Brahman. He was very disturbed by the cartridges which were introduced into the British army by the British officers. Uh, those cartridges were made out of cow fat or pig fat. Pig fat is abhorrent for the Muslims and cow fat is abhorrent for the Hindus. So Hindus and Muslims are both disturbed by this new invention or this new introduction into the, into the, the, the military arsenal of the British Empire. And some of the soldiers, they rebelled and the rebellion grew in, uh, in, in intensity. And then before it could be controlled, it reached many other places in the Indian subcontinent, including Delhi. The last Mughal emperor in Delhi, Bahadur Shah Zafar, was besieged by these re rebellious soldiers, trained by the British Empire. They were native soldiers, but they were trained by the British. Right? So they had these military skills, 
which even the British feared because they, ha- they are the ones who trained them, right? So they went and they besieged the, the, the palace of the king and the king was forced to support them. So he had to put his name in rebellion. And then a lot, other, lot of other Muslims got involved as well as they called it, you know, Jihad Fi Sabirillah. Although I believe it was not Jihad Fi Sabirillah, it was Fasad Fi Sabirillah. Astaghfirullah. It was Fasad. It was, it was, because it was completely out of control. There were no leaders. And this is why some of the scholars at the time, they opposed it. People like Sayyid Nazir Hussain Dehlavi, rahmatullahi, who was in Delhi, was one of the greatest scholars living at that time. He discouraged the Muslims from taking part in this rebellion because it is not jihad. Jihad doesn't mean killing innocent men, women and children. It doesn't mean that. Some of these rebels, they actually lined British prisoners. They had caught they had caught these British personnel within Delhi and in the outskirts of Delhi. Among them were women and children and men. They lined them up and in front of the king of Delhi, Bahadur Shah Zafar, they shot them dead. The king tried to dissuade them. The, tra- the king tried to, to stop the murder, the massacre, but they didn't listen to him. So they were shot dead. And uh, a lot of the Muslim scholars were highly disturbed by this development. And they said, this is not us. We don't represent this. So that's why some of the scholars actually went against it. Other scholars, they said, no, this is Muslims should lead it and they should turn it into a jihad movement if it's not one. It was an unfortunate event. It was a catastrophe on a grand scale. Muslims suffered daily as a result. Muslims were directly accused by the British Empire and people who were running the administration deliberately uh, deprived Muslims of important posts, important educational opportunities, and even giving them any place in in, uh, in any important uh, you know field in the society. So the Hindus took full advantage of that situation. So they were able to take all the important posts. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan and people like him, the intellectuals, were looking at this situation. If the British left today. The Muslims will be completely destroyed because of their inability to run a state under Hindus. If Hindus, if, if, if the British left a democracy, and what is democracy? Majoritarianism. Right? The majority, 51% imposes its rule on 49% minority. Yeah? Yeah? This is what Iqbal said about democracy. He knew if the British left today and they left democracy behind, it will be completely outnumbered and we will lose all the power we currently have. That's why Sayyid Ahmad Khan came up with this idea of uh, a new homeland. But he was unfortunately very impressed by the British Empire and its technological advancement and its military strength and its material strength and its economic strength. And Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was taken to Britain on a trip where he was given titles and a lot of respect and a lot of honor because he was one of those people who uh, argued for the British to, to remain the rulers of India. He was in favor of the British rule. Um, not that he wanted it as an ideal situation. Of course, we know so Sayyid Ahmad Khan was a sincere man. I don't blame him for um, what he did in terms of establishing the Aligar College, which he established to educate the Muslims enough so that they can come up and take some important fields in, uh, in the system. This is what he wanted to do. He was a very sincere man with Muslims. As far as the Muslims are concerned, he was very sincere. But he made major mistakes. When it comes to theology, he was too impressed by uh, the British literature. And unfortunately, he was one of those people because of his influence or he, him being influenced by British literature at the time, he kind of started to... Uh, reject certain established principles of Islam. For example, he rejected the reality of mu'ajazat, right? Miracles. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan rejected miracles. 
The miracles don't exist. So for him or to him, every miracle in the Quran had to be explained naturalistically. So he became a naturey. In Urdu we call it naturey or in, in English he was a naturalist. So he started to explain every miracle like, for example, Musa al Islam when he split the sea, it was Madhu Jazar. Right? Or, you know, other things. He start, uh, there is a very powerful book. I all, I, I really strongly recommend it's in Urdu. It's called Aynai Parveziyat. Okay? By Abdurrahman Kailani. Rahmatullah. Aynai Parveziyat. It, it goes through all these things and talks about where this Hadith rejection actually started. Okay, it's a very extensive history of hadith rejection and some of the best books on Inkar al-Hadith, uh, refutations on Inkar al-Hadith, responses from the ulama on Inkar al-Hadith or rejection of hadith are written in the Urdu language, believe it or not. Because the fitna arose here in the Urdu language. The fitna arose in the Urdu language, so it had to be handled in the Urdu language. You will hardly find anything good, anything extensive in the Arabic language or the Persian language on Inkar al-Hadith. So the best works on Inkar al-Hadith, its refutation are to be found in the Urdu language. And inshallah, in due course, I can mention some very quickly. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan was the first one to come up with this idea that we have to now, he started to justify the theory of evolution, right? So he became a naturalist. But the first one to openly come out and say that we reject hadith we don't accept hadith at all at all was a man called abdullah chakralavi right this was a man called abdullah chakralavi who came up with this idea and there's a hadith of rasulullah that there will come a time when people will be leaning on cushions yeah they will be leaning on cushions and they will be saying, I do not accept the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu The Quran is enough for us. Rasulullah sallallahu foretold. And some of the scholars in India, in the subcontinent at the time, when Abdullah Chakralavi literally would give lectures leaning on a cushion and he would be saying to people, I don't accept hadith, Quran is enough for us. And some ulama pointed out, that this is the fulfillment of the hadith of Rasulullah his prophecy. So there will be people leaning on cushions and they will be saying, I don't accept hadith, I don't believe in it. The Quran alone is enough for us, which is absurd. Which is absurd. Parts of Quran cannot be comprehended without sunnah, the sunnah of the Prophet explaining those parts. I had a very long interesting discussion in London Speaker's Corner, Hyde Park, with a hadith rejecter. Uh, and it was like over an hour of discussion with him. And I asked him these simple questions. How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you pray? How do you make ghusl? Why do you make ghusl? I asked him. Do you have a wife? Yes, I do have a wife. Do you, when you have intimacy with her, do you, do you make ghusl? After that? And uh, he said, I do. I said, why? The Quran doesn't clarify that. Quran in one verse says, Faqtasilu. In the other verse, in the other verse, the Quran says "fattaharu." When the Quran talks about ghusl, it says "fattasilu, fattaharu." Fattasilu means wash. I asked him, "Wash what?" If we if we put hadith aside, which explains what it means, wash means have a wa have a wash, have a bath, right? For major impurity, right? So explain to me what does Faqtasilu actually mean in the Quran. Wash what? Wash your face, wash your arms, wash your privates, wash what? Fattaharu means purify. Purify what? So if we don't have the sunnah, we cannot explain, you know, explain some of these terms in the Quran. We are completely left without guidance. That's why the sunnah of the Prophet explains the Quran. The Quran is the word of Allah, the sunnah, the hadith is revelation explaining the Quran explaining the Quran so Abdullah Chakralavi was the first person who came out and he uh, openly rejected hadith then came another man called Aslam Jirajpuri who also rejected hadith influenced by Chakralavi and then came another man called Ghulam Parvez 
and then people he went to the next he went to a next level of rejection uh, rejecting hadith he started to interpret the quran from his own mind and we have some people doing that today there is some person called khalid uh, what's his name there's one in karachi muhammad sheikh sorry not khalid muhammad sheikh saab muhammad sheikh saab is very eloquent unki urdu badi achhi hai right and he knows the quran well and he uses that to misguide people man ghadat quran ki tari uh, uh, tafsir tashri aur taweel if you free yourself from the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then what are you left with you are left with your own interpretation if the prophet doesn't explain the quran then who does who does mohammad sheikh saab javed javed ahmed gandhi saab parvez saab یعنی ہم اللہ کے نبی کو چھوڑ دیں ان کے بعد جتنے بھی بڑے بڑے اسکالرز آئے ہیں بڑے بڑے علماء آئے ہیں بڑے بڑے آئمہ آئے ہیں ان کو چھوڑ دیں ہم ان کو پکڑ لیں رائٹ وہ شاہ عبد العزیز نے ایک کتاب لکھی تحفہ اتنا شریعہ کے نام سے رحمت اللہ علیہ تو اس کا نام ہی انہوں نے تحفہ اتنا شریعہ رکھا اور ایک نواب تھے اہل تشی میں سے انہوں نے جو ہے لکھنؤ کے علماء ان کو بلایا کہ اس کا جواب لکھا جائے اس کا جواب لکھا جائے تو ایک صاحب نے کوشش کی انہوں نے جواب لکھا تو جب وہ جواب ان کے سامنے لایا گیا تو انہوں نے کہا کہ اس کا موازنہ کیا جائے اس کو دیکھا جائے کہ جواب تسلی بخش ہے یا ایسی جواب لکھ تک بازی ہے تو وہ جن صاحب کو کہا گیا کہ اس کا جو ہے ذرا جو ہے وہ اس کے اوپر آپ اپنا اپنی رائے پیش کریں تو انہوں نے کہا کہاں دہلی کا شہزادہ اور کہاں پتہ نہیں کس شہر کا انہوں نے کہا جلاحا جہاں کے جلاحے مشہور تھے کہاں دہلی کا شہزادہ اور کہاں مجھے بنارس کے بنارس کے بنارس کا جلاحا کو اس طرح کر کے انہوں نے کوئی بات کی تھی کہ دہلی کے شہزادے سے مراد ان کی تھی شاہ عبد العزیز رحمۃ اللہ علیہ کہ ان کی نشو و نماؤں کی تعلیم دہلی میں ہوئی He was educated in Delhi. His language was very strong. His slope, his, his methodology, the way he presented his arguments was very strong. And this guy, he's, 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 no, he's, not, he's, not, he's a nobody in comparison to, to Shah Abdul Aziz. So how can we even do a comparison? So today, these people are sitting in front of you, who are sitting in front of you, and we have other examples in the past of ulama who had memorized Uh, pre-islamic poetry who had memorized big big chunky volumes of hadith and they had overturned every single word of hadith and i'll come to address that point very quickly so these are some people these individuals who have come to reject hadith okay it started from sir sayyid ahmed khan then it went into this man called Abdullah Chakralwi and then Aslam Jiraj Puri and then Parvez, Ghulam Parvez came and he rejected Hadith in totality and people who followed him were called Parvezis because it was a firqa and they were called Parvezis and then came later on people who did not reject Hadith openly and in, to- in totality. They realized that if you, hadith, if you reject Hadith in totality, you separate yourself from the main body of the Ummah. Muslims become very, very vigilant about you. اب کوئی بندہ آگے کہتے ہیں میں حدیث کو مانتے ہی بخاری مسلم ترمزی ابن ماجہ سنت ابو داؤد نسائی سب جھوٹ ہے اٹس آل اللہ اف سم ون کمز الانگ سیز آل دیز سکس بکس یو ہیو کلیکٹیڈ اور یو اسکالرز دے آر اے بنچ آف لائز یو ول امیڈیٹلی بیکم یو نو یو ول بیکم ویری سرپرائز یو تھنک سو فان اللہ دس از ویری اب نارمل وٹ دس پرسن از سینگ دس پرسن از سینگ نیو سو نا وٹ وی ہیو از اے نیو فتنا ٹوڈے people who reject hadith in a subtle way they do it subtly bade jo hai smoothly wo they, they reject hadith in a way that you don't realize they actually rejecting hadith and who are people like that people like javed ahmed gandhi saab who is actually a hadith rejecter but he comes across as if he accepts hadith but he has a different understanding of it no he rejects hadith hadith rejection comes in different forms and shapes One form is complete rejection outrightly. We don't accept hadith. That's one type. The other type is we accept some 
and others we do not accept because they the ones that fit into our mind or the one the ones that agree with our conception of normality we accept it the ones that do not fit into our intellectual uh, framework there is a problem with them for example the age of aisha radiyallahu anha aisha radiyallahu anha she was married to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at a very young age at 9 and it doesn't actually fit into their minds they don't accept it their minds don't accept it because they have been conditioned by the modern age right what what's happening in the societies today they have been conditioned by that today if you heard someone got married to a 9 years old you'll be shocked right do we agree you'd be shocked hold hold on a second 9 no, no saal ki bachi se nikah ki hai today but aaj se 100 saal pehle exactly a century ago in the year 1918 that wouldn't be a big problem even in the west even in the west where these ideas came from initially don't believe me don't believe me what was the age of consent in britain for as late as 1880s what was the age of consent what i mean by age of consent is marriageable age legally by law what was the marriageable age in britain as late as the year 1880 i'm talking about the year 1880 1880 tak nikah ki umar kya thi bartaniya mein 10 who said 10 aap keh rahe hain who else 7 7 saal according to who am i making these things up am i coming up with these ideas that you know william blackstone's commentaries on the english law william blackstone was an 18th century judge who wrote commentaries on the english law in four volumes published in the 18th century 1760s and then further editions were printed as late as the early 19th century and then his commentaries were published again in the 1860s with new additions into the law and that law as long as the 1860s stood that the marriageable age for a girl is 7 okay it was not recommended but it was if someone got married to a 7 years old a girl he wasn't doing anything illegal according to the english law 10 was fine 12 was perf- perfectly okay no problem you can get married to a 12 year aaj 12 saal ki bachchi se koi shaadi kare kya hoga पाकिस्तान में फगेट इंग्लैंड फगेट अबाउट इंग्लैंड इन पाकिस्तान पूरा खानदान उसके ऊपर जो है हमला कर देगा पूरा खानदान इफ सम वन वॉक्स इन विद ट्वेल्व ईयर्स ओल्ड वाइफ आई एम नॉट सेंग दू शुड डू इट डोंट गेट मी रॉन्ग ये जस्ट आई एम प्रेजेंटिंग अनैरियो यू नो अ सिचुएशन इमेजिन हाइपोथेटिकल सिचुएशन इन पाकिस्तान इन इस्लामाबाद इन दिस हाउस someone walks in one of your sons or one of your cousins walks in with a 12 years old wife kya kya alqab milenge usko kya kya laqab denge aap usko main bataun shall i say some of them ha huh? be sharam be haya jahil right zalim aur bhi bahut sare alfaaz hai jo main bol nahi sakta right do you agree with me or do you am, am i exaggerating right kyunki societies have changed values have changed we have been influenced we have been conditioned this generation which is sitting in front of me right now they cannot even imagine comprehend something like that but a century ago these things were perfectly normal anyone could walk in with a 10 years old as a wife no problem baitho chai chai piyo khana khao mubarak ho mashallah singing and dancing like this we have examples historical examples For why do you need historic examples when the law allows it in a country in england in britain right so these people are conditioned so that's why what are the causes of hadith rejection of modern hadith rejection now i come to the causes i have mentioned few individuals old and new started in the subcontinent it's a new phenomenon altogether it happened 1200 years ago it was stopped then it was confronted it was buried forever and then it reemerged in india in the subcontinent 
in the 19th century, right? Some Muslim intellectuals, no doubt they were intellectuals, but being an intellectual doesn't mean that you are a scholar of Islam. You have actually studied the tradition of Islam, the transmission of Hadith. It doesn't mean that. So what are the qualities of Hadith rejectors? What are the qualities? Quality number one. They will be heavily influenced by Western thought or colonial thought. They will be mentally colonized, right? They make Western political, moral, philosophical system a judge over Islam. Do you understand? Borrow your shades. Okay. So my, I don't need them by the way. Eh? But when I put them on, I see different. Something changes. Something changes. Now if I color them green, if I color them green, when I put them on, what am I going to see? Green. green, right? In some places, goats, bakriya, they're not used to do eating, you know, eating yellow grass. <laughs> so they put green shades on their eyes. <laughs> so that the grass looks green from the other side, huh? So when you put on shades of a culture, of a philosophical system, of a political system on your eyes and you see through those shades to look at another system which speaks for itself on its own terms, then you will see a distorted picture of that system. Do you agree? When you don't allow a system to speak for itself or to work within its own framework, then you will always get a distorted system. <coughs> so when you mix uh, chana chart with uh, with uh, no, no, fruit chart, no. chana chart with uh, uh, <coughs> trifle, huh? Fruit trifle, something sweet, and mix it up. Right? There will be a reaction. You will have food poisoning, you will get problems, right? Likewise, when you mix Islam with Kufr, or when we mix Islam with non-Islamic ideologies, right? You will get a mishmash. And then you will have food poisoning, right? Or something happened. Leave Islam to speak for itself on its own terms and leave the Western philosophical political system to speak for itself on its own terms. If it works for the Westerners, we wish them well. We wish them well. But for the Muslims, if you really want to be Muslims, then understand Islam on its own terms. Right? So what happened was, some of these intellectuals in the 19th century, they put on Western shades to study the culture, the civilization, and the tradition of Islam. And they ended up with these distortions. Some of the things in Hadith did not fit into the Western mindset or the Western uh, uh, thinking, which was continuously evolving. By the way, Western philosophical system or Western thinking or Western thought has still not stopped evolving. It is still evolving. There is no limit to changing it. Okay. It has been evolving for the last thousand years. Western philosophers keep coming with new theories, with new ideas, and they are applied again and again in the societies, and the societies are still experimenting, right? And what we are witnessing right now is an outcome of the Enlightenment thinking, the, the age of Enlightenment which, which happened in the 18th century when Western philosophers came to rise or came to prominence and they started to present their theories, social theories or political theories, economic theories, uh, political theories in the form of, for example, John Locke, uh, economic theories, people like Adam Smith, right? Uh, social or, uh, or what do you call it? Theories on uh, population. Uh, we have uh, Thomas Paine, sorry, not Thomas Paine, uh, Thomas Malthus, yes, absolutely. So these philosophers came up with these theories and 
the dominant philosophy that governs Western societies is called utilitarianism, which in other words can be translated as consequentialism. Consequentialism means uh, if, if, if actions do not have bad consequences, then you can actually do them. You know, ends justify the means, right? Okay, so um, this is how the system goes. Uh, I don't want to turn this into a lecture on Western philosophy, coming back to the Hadith rejection. So the Hadith rejection, one quality you will find in these people who reject Hadith is they are heavily influenced by colonial thought. Okay, istemari soch. Colonial masters left their bodies, but never left their minds. They still colonize mentally. That's one thing. Second thing, Second quality in them is jahl, ignorance of the Islamic tradition. Most of these hadith rejectors, people like Muhammad Sheikh, even including Javed Ahmad Ghamdi Saab, respectfully, sit them down and question them about Ilm al Rijal, Diraya or Riwaya, okay? Ye jo, you know, these sciences within the science of hadith. And discuss deep topics with them as to why you reject hadith for example what are your basis why do you cast doubts right and you will find them to be very ignorant on basic things on the science of hadith another quality in them is they are heavily influenced by the works of orientalists mustashrikeen mustashrikeen right mustashrikeen are people who wrote who started writing in the 19th century mainly from they were Germans they were Dutch they were English they were French they started to study Islam the history of Islam and they had their own lens looking at Islam and because they used their lens which was still evolving when the lens is continuously changing what will it show you right they will they will they won't they won't be stabilized you won't be able to see clearly what you're looking at so the lens evolve over there and then they're using that lens to understand and study islam so people like ignaz goldzeyer theodore noldek people like uh, sprenger people like william muir who was an orientalist writing in india okay so one of the necessities was to actually suppress islamic movement in india as well because one of the causes of the Indian mutiny 1857 was that the British officers, some of them became even evangelical Christians. And they started to spread Christianity through the power of the empire. Okay, so they started to bring in missionaries to India to preach Christianity to Muslims. And in this, uh, there were disturbances, right? Muslim scholars challenged some of these missionaries to cite one incident in 1854 there was a debate that took place in Agra in Akbarabad Akbar Abad is also known as Agra in an Indian city between a German missionary a German evangelist named Fander and Maulana Rahmatullah Kehranavi Rahmatullah Kehranavi was not mainly aware of Christian theology but there was another man called Wazir Khan. Wazir Khan had studied medicine in Britain. He had come to Britain. He studied medicine in Britain. And when he studied medicine, out of interest, he started to read works on Christianity. Published in Britain at that time. And because of the growing rationalist movement in Britain or in Europe, generally speaking, due to the Enlightenment period, a lot of philosophers, historians, theologians, they started to attack Christianity. Because atheism grew in the 18th century in Europe. Trinity didn't make sense. They had realized the Bible is all altered. It's a corrupted word attributed to God. Right? So a lot of these things came out and Wazir Khan was able to read these books and learned some very powerful arguments which Fonder was not aware of. Fonder was very well learned in the Quran and the Hadith, just like we have Jay Smith today. Do you know who Jay Smith is? I've debated him many times in the park, right? Yeah, Jay Smith, 
He knows more about the Quran and the Sunnah than he knows about Christianity. Because that's, what, that's all he does. That's, he will quote verses on top of verses from the Quran. Right? But when, he, when it comes to Christianity, the Bible, he's not very well aware of Christian theology, Christian scholarship. Wazir Khan had studied Christian scholarship. He came back, he supervised Molana Keranavi. Molana Keranavi debated Fonda. Fonda was completely destroyed in that debate. And William Muir was present in that very debate. And Muir then wrote books against Islam to do damage control. Uh, you know, he wrote a biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in four volumes. Then he wrote a history of the Caliphs of Islam. Then he wrote a history of the Mamluks and the, 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 the list goes on. So these Orientalists are writing works. And by the way, William Muir was very close to Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was a good friend with him. So... All of these works influenced some of these people, these intellectuals. And because they had little knowledge of Islamic tradition, the science of Hadith was very uh, underdeveloped anyway in India. There were people in India whom you can count on your one hand who mastered the science of Hadith. And unfortunately, they didn't know the English language to be able to confront some of these Orientalist uh, ideas. There were people like, subhanAllah, Sayyid Nazir Hussain, Dehlavi, Rahmatullahi, Muhaddis in Delhi. There were people like uh, Nawab Siddiq Hassan Khan, a great scholar of Hadith. There were people like um, uh, Sheikh Hussain bin Muhsin Al-Ansari Al-Yamani, a Yemeni scholar who was teaching in Bhopal, uh, who was invited to Bhopal by Nawab Siddiq Hassan Khan uh, to come and lecture on Hadith in India. And then he produced two students who wrote very powerful commentaries on two important books of hadith sunan abu daud and sunan at-tirmizi abu daud um, the commentary on it was written by shamsul haq adim abadi who was a direct student of uh, sheikh um, uh, hussein bin muhsin al ansari al yamani and the other student was uh, abdurrahman sheikh abdurrahman muhammad muhaddis mubarak puri who wrote this commentary on tirmizi titled Tuhfatul Ahwazi. These scholars were there, but there were very few people who could speak English and confront the works of Orientalists. So the Orientalists were mainly read by so-called intellectuals. And these intellectuals, when they read the works of Orientalists, they thought, they assumed, Iska to koi jawab hoi nahi sakta. Kyunki aap log jail hain. Ek jail bandha jab ek kitab padhta hai. Right? Usko kuch nahi pata. Right? اور جب وہ کتاب پڑھتا ہے اور اس کتاب میں بڑے پاورفل آرگیومنٹس ہیں مثال کے طور پہ رچرڈ ڈاکنز کی کتاب ہے گاڈ ڈیلوژن ٹھیک ہے جو نیا نیا بچہ جوان ہوتا ہے کسی یونیورسٹی میں جاتا ہے انگلش کو نئی چھوڑی تھوڑی نئی نئی انگلش آتی ہے اس کو ماڈرن بننے کا بڑا شوق ہوتا ہے کہتا ہے میں رچرڈ ڈاکنز کی کتاب پڑھوں گا رائٹ جو وہ ڈاکنز کی کتاب پڑھا اوہ اس کا تو جواب کوئی کوئی مولوی دنیا کا پیدا ہی نہیں ہوا جو جواب دے سکے رائٹ اور دیر آر پیپل ہو ہیو ڈسمینٹل ڈاکنز Uh, even to even to a sentence, right? There are people who have written books, uh, Christians and Muslims, uh, and they're not necessarily Molvis. Okay, our brother Hamza Zorzis has written a book called The Divine Reality, uh, dismantling a lot of atheist ideas, atheistic ideas in the light of science, philosophy, and all other things, right? So, just because you are jahil on a topic and you read a book on that topic from uh, the opposing side and because you don't know the answers because you haven't studied doesn't mean there are no answers the answers are there you just not you just don't know them you have no idea so a lot of orientalists have in influenced these hadith rejectors so what are the causes as to why they are hadith rejectors what are the causes i have talked about the qualities the qualities you will find in them jahal Okay, they are influenced by colonial thought, right? And they are influenced by Orientalists. But what are the causes? In some cases, they know they're wrong. In some cases, they know they're wrong. And how do you know, how do you know that they know that they are wrong? Because when you challenge them to a debate, they will never come to a debate. They don't want to debate. They will run away from you. They will run. With, with, the, the, with the tail in between the legs. They will run. They will never come and face you. Because they don't... They have too much to lose. They have too much to lose. If they come... If, they, if you make them look like idiots in a debate, finished. 
Their followers will realize that this person, all, uh, you know, the, the beautiful talking and eloquence is simply sophistry. It's rhetoric. There is no substance to it. Right? So, they, they know they're wrong, but to earn money, to make money, they will come out and say controversial things. The easiest way to do it is to criticize Islam. Islam ke baare mein ko naya shosha chhod do. Yahan bhi Pakistan mein bhi ho raha na. If you want to be famous, you want to be, uh, you know, put on pedestal. Uh, just say something stupid about Islam. Ko naya shosha chhod do. Come up with something new, and you will become famous immediately. Controversy sells. Some people are pure uh, controversialists. They just like attention, money, or fame, and that's the problem. Another cause is, again. Um, um, the lack of knowledge, why they haven't studied, um, they haven't studied Islam, and that's why they are the way they are, and they think they're right. Another cause was that came to my mind earlier uh, that they are being funded, they are being supported by forces that want to promote uh, what we call Baidini in the society or lack of religion. Or they want to confuse people, the masses, about religion, about Islam, so that people stay away from religion, right? And a lot of these people, these Hadith uh, rejectors, they are very popular among people who don't want to practice Islam. They don't want to practice Islam. They just want to make excuses. Hijab, nahi banna, kyunki Gandhi sahab ne kya diya, hijab nahi banna, to Gandhi sahab ne kya diya. You know, Javed Ahmed Gandhi has said it. Right? So, hijab bani, there's no need to wear hijab. Right? It's like that. And if you want to deal in riba, or if you, they make everything halal for you. Because, you see, when you take hadith out of the picture, your life becomes very easy to them. Right? You don't have to abstain from, you know, a lot of things. A lot of limits that Islam puts. You are freed. Right? You become like a Christian, believe in the cross and you have salvation. Right? So you don't have to do your namaz. You don't have to do all these things. Hajj ki bhi koi zurat nahi hai. Right? And then they misinterpret the Quran. They do all kind of stupid interpretations of the Quran. And because of that, they are misguided. So, uh, this was a brief summary of the fitna of Inkar al Hadith in the subcontinent. And in another sitting, inshallah, we can possibly discuss in length some of the arguments and their rebuttals, right? Today was an introduction to the history of Inkar al-Hadith in the subcontinent primarily. And I hope I have um, done justice to the topic. And in the future, in another setting, inshallah, as I stated, we will deal with the arguments one by one, what arguments they bring up and, you know, for example, the age of Aisha was one of the things, I mean, when things do not fit into their frame of mind, they start to reject them. They just wash your hands away without giving any reasons. Now, I asked them a question that if Bukhari has reasons to believe that the Prophet ﷺ said something, definitely, without a doubt, what basis do you have today to reject it? For example, there are reports in Sahih Bukhari, there are three people between Imam Bukhari and the Messenger of Allah. Three people. Bukhari narrates from his teacher, Maki ibn Abi Ibrahim. Maki ibn Abi Ibrahim uh, narrates from his teacher, Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid. Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid narrates from his teacher, Salma ibn al -Aqwa, And he narrates from the Prophet So which one is a liar in the chain? Tell us why do we need to reject these reports? Then there are reports with four narrators. Abdullah bin Yusuf taught Bukhari. And then he was taught by Malik bin Anas, Malik bin Anas from Nafi, and Nafi from Abdullah bin Umar and the Prophet. Four people in the chain between Bukhari and Rasulullah which one, which one is a liar? All of them were public figures teaching publicly what they had heard from their teachers. And those teachers had taught publicly. They were known figures in public to thousands of people. And the list goes on up to the Prophet Why do we need to reject this? This is why they don't come for a debate. They have erroneous reasons to reject hadith. Some of them... Yes, inshallah, I'm going to come to Q&A in a minute. Inshallah, I'm finishing right now. So, a lot of these questions come up. 
For example, uh, about the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha that she was married to the Prophet when, he was, when she was nine and the Prophet was 53. Today, currently in the modern age, because we have been influenced by liberal secular thought, it is abhorrent to us, right? Uh, back in the day, even when the Europeans were struggling with liberalism and secularism, it wasn't a problem for them. It wasn't a problem for them. No, no, no. It was legally allowed. It was legally allowed. Before you jump to the 7th century to condemn the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, can we start with the 19th century and tell all the English people that all your ancestors were a bunch of pedophiles? Yes, because it was legally allowed. All the judges, all the lawyers, all the people who practiced that law were a bunch of pedophiles. Before we go on to a person and, and then go to the 18th century and then go to the the 17th and, the, and the, the 16th and the 15th and then you see in the 15th century you have King Henry VIII getting married to his wife at 12. Right? And the list goes on. There are so many. The canon law, the Catholic canon law. What was the age of consent? What was the marriageable age? 10. 10. So, all of these things, these people who reject hadith, okay, hadith ka inkar kar do, jaan chhoot jai. This is the logic. The logic is, hadith ka inkar kar do, jaan hi chhoot jai, kya zura defend karne ki? No. We don't see territory just because of, just because someone doesn't like it. So, inshallah, in the future, we will discuss these things in detail and look at some of the arguments. So, let me remind you very quickly, we talked about the causes and the reasons, sorry, causes, and the reasons why people become mun munkarine hadith or uh, they are guilty of or they are suffering from inkar al hadith. Uh, sometimes it is due to ignorance, and most times, in my opinion, it is due to ignorance with Islamic sciences. Some people make assumptions about Islamic sciences, they think that what they think is true about Islam. That's the assumption. They think Islam has to fit into their social construct, social conditioning. Every single human on the planet is conditioned. Every single person in the world is conditioned by environment, by culture, by language, by upbringing, by education, by the politics, by the weather, call it the climate, it can be a number of factors that condition the thinking and the being of a person. Do you all agree with that? Yes? So people from Pakistan are not like the people from Brazil. And people from Nigeria are not exactly the same as the people of Sweden. And why they are different? I'm not talking about the looks and the ethnicity. I'm talking about how they feel, how they think, how they talk, how they express their views, all of that. Because they have gone through different procedures of being conditioned. Sometimes it's the fashion that conditions your mind. The dominant thought or the political system that conditions you. For example, I gave you examples in the last session that uh, when Mughals were governing India, the culture was very dominant. The Mughals had formed a culture. There was a court culture. There was a fashion that was going on. Persian poetry was very popular among the, the literati of that society. People would write poetry in Persian just to make a place in the society, right? Just to be accepted among the educated people of the society. Your Persian had to be good, your Arabic had to be good, okay? Not necessarily your Hindi or Urdu. By the way, Hindi is a spoken language of North India. Urdu is a child of Hindi. The language you speak, Urdu, is originally an Indian language. And Hindi has a very strong influence um, on it from Sanskrit. While with Urdu, we have a very strong influence from the Arabic and the Persian language. 
So Urdu became the language of the Muslims in the subcontinent, mainly in the 18th century. Uh, it became a literary language, while previously it wasn't a literary language as such. Persian was. The Persian language was a literary language uh, pre-18th century India. So the fashion was that people used to learn these languages and even Hindus, believe it or not, and Sikhs had become Persianized or Islamified or Mughalized, depending on how you want to see it. The Sikh gurus, you know the Sikh, the religion, Sikh religion, you know about it, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Sikhs believe in 10 Gurus and if you look at the, the last Guru, Guru Gobind Singh, if you look at his paintings, old ones, he looks like a Mughal. His turban is Mughal, his kameez is Mughal, his pyjama is Mughal, right? The way he's dressed, the, the armory, the saddle, the way, you know, the culture, you, you know, he's actually, he has been Mughalized. He wrote poetry in Persian. There's a famous poem attributed to him called Zafarnama, which he wrote to the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb Alamgir to express his feelings about the situation he was going through. Likewise, Hindus, they wrote in Persian. There were Hindus who were writing poetry in Persian. They had become Persianized because of the culture, because of the environment, the conditioning. Then the British came and the culture changed. In the 19th century, they become Anglicized. The Mughal clothing was put aside and the English clothing was put on. So because English became the dominant uh, power politically, people started to dress like the English. They started to speak the English language. Persian language was put on the shelf. Or it was shelved. Six centuries... Muslims were expressing themselves in the Persian language mainly from the period starting from the Delhi Sultanate, uh, you know, um, the government or their dominance up to the Mughal period, the decline of the Mughals. Then the British became a dominant power and everyone started to, the Hindus became Anglicized, right? And the Muslims are still struggling with this cultural, uh, the clash of cultures. Right, some Muslims had chosen to adopt. Uh, sorry, some Muslims had chosen to adopt the previous culture, call it the Mughal culture or the Islamic culture or the Persian culture or the Arabic culture, and others had adopted the English culture. This is why. Aligarh University was formed. The reason why I'm telling you these things is to understand that people just don't come out with ideas out of the blue. Those ideas have background. They have reasons. They have causes, right? So in Karul Hadith is another idea that came to prominence due to uh, Western thinking or coloni colonial thinking, colonial influences. Uh, some of the questions people ask today about Hadith and the doubts people cast on hadith literature, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu is because of these external influences. We have been affected. Maybe you don't know you have been affected. The reason why you are dressed the way you are, and this is not, I'm not taking a dig. This is the reality of the times. Some of the brothers here in front of me who are evidently practicing Muslims, but they are dressed in, uh, in, in, if you want to call it Western clothing, right? Or English clothing or call it, you know, Western, I like to use the term Western clothing. Uh, we know what, what we mean by the West. The West is towards the West, okay? Uh, generally, it, it refers to Western Europe or Western civilization, okay? And again, to clarify, this is not a dig at the Western civilization. There are great things about the Western civilization. There are great achievements in the Western civilization, like they were in the Islamic civilization, and like there is potential to repeat the same within the Islamic civilization, right? But we have been affected, possibly without having realized it, right? If the fashion at the time was to wear a turban with a flower popping up, right, from the turban, 
or wearing jewels on the turban or wearing gowns if for example Mughals were to return today if the Mughals were to return today or if the Ottomans were to come back to power in this current day and age and they were the dominant political economic and military power in the world are you listening and with military and economic strength comes academic strength because you have the money you can fund universities you can fund scholars who write top of the range works in philosophy in literature in poetry in history their research is the top so other people start to adopt your ways because you are dominant culturally economically politically and academically academia academic progress is directly linked to economic prosperity like will durant you know one of the philosophers he said that civilization uh, uh, consists of four elements a civilization this come tahzeeb kehte hain it consists of four elements and those elements are what number one economic prosperity number two political stability number three pursuit of knowledge and arts number four moral traditions these are the four elements that make a civilization and all of these four elements rest upon one pillar and that pillar is a sense of security justice justice and security are lazim and malzum if there is no justice you won't have security okay and when you have security when your society is secure then you start to make progress so all of these four elements rest upon one pillar and that pillar is called security a sense of security so economic provisions are linked to political stability and political stability is linked to pursuit of knowledge and arts and pursuit of knowledge and arts is linked to moral traditions and all of these four, four elements were um, important ingredients of the Islamic civilization that's why the Islamic civilization is known as the Islamic civilization Islamic civilization ya tahzeeb islami is based upon the Islamic tradition without the Islamic tradition there is no Islamic civilization is simple without the Quran and the Sunnah that explains the Quran there is no Islamic civilization you cannot imagine the child without the mother do you agree who comes first the child or the mother chicken and egg argument huh who comes first who comes first huh? mothers come first yeah this is why Rasulullah he talked so much about the rights of mothers so mothers come first so Quran is the mother of Islamic civilizations or civilization if you want to put it in one basket because we I believe Islamic civilizations existed and they varied uh, from time to time from place to place depending on where they were geographically are you getting bored can you all understand what I'm talking about okay good so I'm explaining how ideas arise why do people start thinking in a particular way why does Islamic art looks the way it looks huh why does the Arabic calligraphy looks the way it looks why do we recite the Quran in a particular way why does it have a particular effect on us all these things are related to our civilization and the causes of our civilization so we are conditioned by our environments ideas do affect us so when Muslims are politically economically academically dominant the Europeans were copying the Muslims it's natural Muslims were militarily economically politically and academically were the leaders of the world for nearly a thousand years for over a thousand years you are simply unaware of it I'll be very crude and brutal with you people who are listening to me right now you are completely unaware of it if you will tell me today that you know what Islamic civilization is I'll tell you no 
You don't know. Because I know you don't know. Who has read Diwani Hafiz here? Diwani Hafiz. I'm not saying it's a, it's, a, it's a prerequisite of being a Muslim. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to show you who has read, read all the books of Imam Ghazali or some of the books of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah or some of the works of Ibn al-Hajr al-Asqalani or some of the philosophy of Shah Waliullah. Bas. Hawa nikal gi sabki. This, this is the point. You cannot know a civilization without knowing it. And how do you know it? You know it by studying it. By thinking about it. Or aapke bade bade scholars jo hain aaj, jo zinda hain, even they don't know. They don't know. This is why you haven't produced one Shah Waliullah in the last two centuries. Pichle 200 saal mein Shah Waliullah ki koi aapne misal paida ki hai. He was a product of a particular way of thinking, a culture, a society, a, a sense of being. Shah Waliullah was not just normal, some, uh, some dude from the street, some Tom, Dick and Harry. The reason why we have completely lost touch with the Islamic civilization is because we have been dominated by another civilization politically, economically, militarily and academically. Your curriculum is made elsewhere. Who knows? Iqbal ki shahari bhi nahi yaad aapko. Sorry? Wo Iqbal ki ek nazam hai na, Afrang Zada. Who has read it? Kisi ne padhi hai? Afrang Zada. Usko zara google karein. Urdu mein kisi ke paas agar hai wo. Afrang Zada. Mujhe bhi yaad nahi, mujhe bhi bhala diya aapne. And Iqbal talks about it amazingly. Iqbal refers to it that we are a frank. So, that's why we have assumed for this reason uh, there is a presumption before even the discussion begins that what the Western thinkers think is the default position. To judge another culture, another civilization, you have to use a criteria. When you say something is good, you have to know the bad to measure the good against it. Kya baat hai Iqbal ki? Ab ye Urdu shari ka ek wo shuru ho jayega yaha par lecture. Right, so I don't want to turn it into that. Iqbal talks about this problem of colonial influences on the Muslim mind. And he hits the nail on the head. Tera wujood sarapa tajalliye afrang. Who is going to translate that? Iska tarjima koon karega? Ab urdu hi nahi aati aap logon ko. Right? Tera wujood sarapa tajalli afrang. Your being Colored with the is an example, is an epitome. Yes, exactly. Your being, your existence is an example of uh, uh, the influences of the afrang. The afrang to him was uh, colonialism. He's talking about colonialism. Right? کہ تو وہاں کے امارت گروں کی ہے تعمیر because you have been made by them you have been made by western architects that's why you look westernized because mind makes the body you will look like what you think like do you agree? Huh? if you love Shah Rukh Khan and you all day and all night, you're thinking of Shah Rukh Khan or Katrina Kaif. You're going to start looking like them, yeah? Do you agree? Huh? 
if you are in love with uh, Tom Cruise, huh? वो देखा आपने कभी बच्चों के कई जो हमारे नए नए बच्चे जो हैं वो जब वो उनको वट मेक्स दम थिंक दैट दे हैव टू हैव अ पोस्टर ऑफ टॉम क्रूज इन द वर्ल्ड बैक इन द डे टू बी माइकल जैक्सन एंड मडोना एंड एंड जॉर्ज माइकल जब मेरे जो जवानी के दिन थे राइट इन द नाइन्टीज वन आई वॉज अ टीन एजर यू नो किड्स यूज टू हैव दीज पोस्टर्स अभी नई नई बुलाई निकल आई हैं अभी नए नए नाम आ गए हैं अब नए नए पोस्टर्स छप रहे हैं राइट यस वाई Why are the kids coming back from school and uh, literally worshiping these people? Because they are being conditioned. Day and night, they are being conditioned to think that these people are admirable. Shah Waliullah ki koi tasvir to unki hai nahi. Shah Waliullah ki koi koi nasiyat kyun nahi lagi hui diwar ke upper? Diwan e Hafiz ke kyun nahi? Wahan par ashar lagay hui Farsi zuban ke. Ya Al Mutanab Al Mutanab bhi jo Arabi ka shair tha, bhot bada. Uski shairi kyun lagi hui? या इमाम गजाली के कोई कोर्ट्स नहीं है कुछ और नहीं है कोई इस्लामिक कैलीग्राफी है अलहमरा पैलेस की जो कैलीग्राफी है वो नहीं है वाई बिकॉज वी आर बीइंग कंडीशनड देन ही गोज ऑन टू इन द नेक्स्ट पार्ट तेरी निगाह में साबित नहीं खुदा का वजूद दैट इन योर आईज गॉड डजन एग्जिस्ट गॉड डजन एग्जिस्ट मेरी निगाह में साबित नहीं वजूद तेरा आई थिंक यू डोंट एग्जिस्ट If you think God doesn't exist, then you don't exist, because you cannot exist without God's existence. It is impossible. So, this is the thinking of Iqbal. Before I start to do Tashri Iqbal ki shairi, uh, we'll come back to our topic. So, even he picked on this, Rahmatullahi alayh, that cultures dominate and they influence. So now, currently, the fashion is in this day and age. that everything the western civilization deems normal has to be normal anything that uh, doesn't fit into the western discourse uh, because colonial discourse colonial discourse has become western discourse today Colon- colonialism was based upon a particular way of thinking it had philosophy backing it Colonialism was backed by science and philosophy. Did you know that? Colonial administrators working in India, those who were working here as the British administrators running the colonial system, were influenced by philosophers like John Stuart Mill, Thomas Malthus. and the writings of adam smith the wealth of nations and david hume extreme skepticism reject, rejection of miracles or all things supernatural so a lot of the colonial uh, administrators were influenced by a number of uh, different philosophies western thinkers that's why they managed to justify a lot of the things they did in colonial lands and then science came in darwin's theory i talked about it even last time darwin came up with his theory in 1859 that theory was used to suppress non white races so a lot of these administrators had become racist they started to think that the white race is the the most evolved race scientifically it is the most uh evolved and advanced race even genetically and non white races are still in the process of evolving they haven't yet fully evolved that's why some of the slave owners in the 19th century they started to use darwin's theory of evolution to suppress the blacks in america they started to say blacks are fully not they're not fully evolved yet they are still in the process of evolving and they wrote books to justify this so it depends on what times you live in and where you live thinking will be influenced by the dominant forces so know that today the reason why we even have to discuss the topic of atheism in the muslim world is because tera wujood hai sarapa tajalli e afrang is because you don't know what islamic civilization is you have no idea 
what our thinkers, our philosophers have written in the past because it's more, mainly in Persian and in the Arabic language. Urdu mein bahut kam hai. So you have been heavily influenced by colonial thinking which became Western thinking later on. Okay. And now the assumption is that we have to judge every other system, including Islam, against the perfect model of Western civilization, as it is claimed. So the presumption is that what colonialism or what Western thought has to say on certain matters is the standard to judge other civilizations by. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Right. So that's the standard you have to judge everything by. Islam mein kide nikalna shuru kar diye aur uski ek bahut badi ek misal jo hai wo inkar e hadith hai kyunki ye sawal pehle utha hi nahi gaye ye jo age of aisha ka issue hai misal ke taur pe isko pichli dafa bhi maine discuss kiya tha hazrat aisha ki umar 9 saal thi aisha was 9 years old when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam got married to her aur aaj ke daur mein this is a classic example of how a particular way of thinking, if it's dominant, affects you. Because this Western secular liberal system is dominant even on the Muslim lands, even even the Muslim world. Yeah, these questions are coming again and again, coming up. Why? Because now the culture has become Bollywood and Hollywood. Bollywood and Hollywood is the norm. Yes. Hollywood first and then Bollywood. It has become the norm. While aap kabhi koi Bollywood ki heroine teen sa- tera saal ki imagine kar sakte hain. Can you imagine a Bollywood movie heroine 13 years old? Hello? Can you imagine Shah Rukh Khan running in the field with a 13 years old girl? Bolo yaar. Huh? No. Yeah. Can you imagine uh Ajkal Konsi hero in Hollywood? Ke? Bade bade stars hai. Daniel Craig, for example. Daniel Craig, you, do you know Daniel Craig? James Bond. Huh? Daniel Craig, James Bond. Can you imagine a 12 or 13 years old heroine in a James Bond movie and James Bond is having an affair with her? And he's having it out with her. Can you imagine? Why? Why? <coughs> because you have never seen that in your societies. Yes? But Shakespeare, his Juliet was 13. Shakespeare ki Juliet to 13 saal ki thi. So if Shakespeare was to write the play today, he would be called a pedophile. Do you understand? Agar Shakespeare was to pen his Romeo and Juliet today, Ro- Juliet had to be 18 years old. She cannot be 13. Times have changed. People have been influenced. Thinking has changed. Lekin up to the 19th century. Isme chai hai? Can I have some tea please? Marcus <laughs> dikhane ke liye rakha hua I want to finish this session and then after the break we'll have Q&A. So Shakespeare's Juliet was 13 and no eyebrows were no eyebrow no eyebrows were raised. No one even flinched. It's not an issue. Even if she was nine years old, it would be it wouldn't it wouldn't have been an issue. Because up to the 19th century, are you listening to me? Up to the 19th century, up to the year 1900, Sun Uniso, how far is that? 118 years. Up to the 19th century, this was not an issue. Actually, according to the English law. In England, you could marry a girl as young as seven years old legally. 
it was the norm it was not an issue and this is clearly stated in the commentaries of William Blackstone on the English law William Blackstone's commentaries on the English law published 1867 although he wrote in the 18th century William Blackstone's commentaries on the English law were published uh, in the second half of the 18th century 1760s onwards he published many editions but then his commentaries were republished with uh, recent editions or re recent developments in the law but this particular law wasn't changed up to the year 1867 because I have a copy in my possession of this particular book I'm quoting from 1867 page 110 published in London William Blackstone's commentaries on the English law it states a girl may be married at the age of seven so before you go to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so all of these Munkarini hadith today who reject the age of Aisha the hadith in Bukhari for example that Rasulullah Sallallahu she was uh, Aisha was betrothed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at six and the marriage was consummated at uh, at uh, nine when she was nine you know this has become a problem for Munkarini hadith because they have been strongly heavily influenced by western liberal secular thought of today not of the 19th century liberalism and secularism existed even in the 19th century when it was not a bad thing at all the moral standard was changed in the 20th century in the early 20th century the moral standard we are living by today the western moral standard by which all the humans are expected to live by so live through or live by um, it came about in the early early 20th century because in the 19th century go and check the list of all the nations and the age of marriage the legal ages of marriage most american states most american states in the 19th century especially in the south the age was nine you could marry a girl at nine years old and some had 10 some had 12 the age of consent do you believe me or you don't believe me if you don't believe me i'll connect to the internet right now and I'll start reading all the scholarly quotes and all the tables, I'll put them in front of you. And possibly I'll request from the brothers when they edit this video, while I'm talking, they can put up these links and some of the things I'm talking about. This can be seen on the screen. So what changed? You know, intellectuals, inkari hadith wale, munkarine hadith, they want to reject you know these reports about Aisha being nine because they feel ashamed they feel as if they have to live by the forever changing system of the West or Western thinking system or Western thought because it's forever changing it's changing rules by the day it's still evolving Western thought is continuously evolving because it's human humans change humans learn new things and they keep changing sometimes for the worst not for the best as we have seen in the 20th century that this human thinking or the western mindset or western thought uh, it can go into any direction it can create fascism in italy it can possibly create nazism the nazis in germany it can create marxism or you know what happened the Bolshevik revolution in Russia Karl Marx was what he was born in Germany he died in England he's buried in the high uh, I think Highgate or Highbury cemetery in London Karl Marx this is what happened in the 20th century now st same things are happening even today so we address the question of atheism today because that is the religion of the powerful do you understand islam became the 
the topic of the day or Islam became the most important topic in the world because it was politically, economically, militarily, academically dominant in the world for over a thousand years. Muslims were very dominant for over a thousand years. Muslims were writing commentaries on the Greek philosophers. Muslims were writing some of the top, of, some of the top books on any topic in the world for over a thousand years. When this was changed and the tide was turned and Western scholars started to work more on science and philosophy, their works became dominant and Muslims went into a political decline. With that political decline came economic decline. With economic decline, a decline became, uh, uh, sorry, came the, 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 the decline of the academic activity and with that came moral decline. Moral decline came with that. Okay, and this is what we're going through right now in the Muslim world. Even though we have so much uh, power, so much resources, we are going through a political decline. With that, we are going through, uh, you know, economic decline or economic uh, problems. And that creates a number of other problems. <clears throat> so it is very clear that the reason we are talking about atheism today or Inkar al-Hadith today, uh, I'm not saying Inkar al-Hadith is atheism, by the way, don't get me wrong, because there are people out there, uh, they take things out of context, they will ignore the entire lecture and they will pick on one thing or one sentence I've said, oh, look at this guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Huh? So please, when you quote me, quote me in context. Okay, so it has become a problem today. You know, some of the some of the Islamic uh, concepts have become problem, uh, become a problem for people. Firstly, those who have no idea what Islamic civilization is and what it stands for. Secondly, because they have thoroughly read the Western tradition and Western civilization or read on it. Uh, they think it is the dominant system and everything has to to live by it. If you want to be normal, basically, just become a Gora. Yeah, uh, jo hamare politicians TV pe bhi examples dete hain. Kya examples dete hain? Huh? What examples do they give of perfection? Jab bhi ko baat karenge, America mein is tarah hota hai. Huh? Right? Britaniya mein is tarah karte hain wo log. Oh bhai, what happened to you? You're supposed to be the role model. You you are supposed to be the role model. You have Islam. Islam should make you a better person. It should make your civilization a better civilization. It should become an example for the rest of the world. Islam should become or the Muslim civilization or the Muslim should become the mirror. The world should look into to fix itself, not the other way around. Muslims shouldn't be looking into another mirror to fix their image. Rather, the Muslim should become the image that the other civilizations look into and fix themselves like it happened in the past. It happened in the past. So in Kari Hadith ka jo issue hai, wo isi liye discuss ho rahe. Because it has been influenced, the thought has been influenced by the dominant forces. So atheism is the religion of the powerful. Okay. So those people who are in power, in media, what, 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 what is being powerful mean today? Who's going to help me? What does being powerful mean today? Okay, you make the people think the way you want them to think. Okay, that's one of the ways to become powerful. But, but what, okay, what, what are three things you will tell me are the origin of power today? Or, or sorry, not, uh, um, how can I put it, important ingredients for power. Money. 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 So we can call it economy. Eco yeah, economy or economic strength. Number one. Number two. Media. Media. Right. Number three. No. Authority is the generalist, vague. So we have two, Econo economic strength, number two uh, is uh, media, because you are now making the masses think. You are telling them what is normal. 
because you're talking to them you are forming their thinking you're conditioning them right <coughs> You can put that under media. Military strength. Military strength. Three things, in my opinion. And there can be more. Of course, there are many more things. Right? Economic. Eco economic power. Economic strength. Media. Whether it's print media, electronic media, or social media, whatever it is. Amazingly, you own none of it. You the Muslims? own none of it you own none of it and those who own it are a bunch of atheists mostly mostly mark zuckerberg who is he but who is he the owner of what fitna book the owner of facebook right mark zuckerberg even though he comes from a jewish background he comes from a jewish background right but he's an atheist. I'm not saying that he is an, he has an agenda to promote atheism through Facebook. It may be so, maybe in subtle ways it might be happening, but I'm not claiming that. I don't have any evidence for it. For, for it. Uh, but I'm only giving you a few examples. Um, what else? Bill Gates. Bill Gates, do you think he's an atheist? I don't think he's a Christian. I don't think he's a Christian. Right? So we can give many examples. We can give many examples. Right? How do you know media is actually, or Western media in particular, is actually promoting atheism more than any, any other way of thinking? How do we know that? How do we know that? We know that by looking at the people who are speaking on the media or the language that, that is spoken on the media. Religion is being attacked, not only Islam. I'm not saying Islam is basically under attack more than all other religions on the planet, right? But religion is generally attacked and undermined or degraded. And uh, some people, the people who are put to represent religion are generally uh, very lame, unable to do it, unqualified uh, and on the other side, when you see atheistic thinkers, you have people like Richard Dawkins, you have people like Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, right? People like, he's dead now, Christopher Hitchens. Um, so on the other hand, when you see people, most experts on Islam, who are speaking on Islam in the Western uh, media, are generally not even Muslims. Ayan Hirsi Ali, the Somali woman, <coughs> who has become an expert on Islam for some reason, right? Tariq Fatah, do you know him? Yes. Uncle Tariq, do you know him? Yes. Yeah, yes. right? One of the biggest enemies of Islam, yes. and I don't mean to say that biggest enemies of Islam means go and kill him. No, I'm not saying that. No, no, no. I'm only stating a fact. He has made it very clear that he doesn't like Islam. He hates Islam, actually. This is very clear. But he pretends to be a Muslim to get acceptance from Western media and Indian media as well. He has been very prominent there. Uh, and now even Indian media has abandoned him because he has no credibility. Even in Hindus. Even Hindus can see through the facade. Right? And there are examples like that. So the reason why we're discussing these topics is, uh, is because uh, the media is promoting these ideas. Atheism is systematically... Richard Dawkins' book... God delusion has become one of the best selling items in the recent history. Why? Why? There are better books out there. Salman Rushdi ki kitab ka kya naam hai? Who knows it? Satanic verses. And it's full of bakwas. It's full of bakwas. It's not even a literary masterpiece. It's not better than Jane Austen's writings. It's not better than some other people writing today. Their writings. But why is that being pumped out there? So there is a reason. that The reason why we, we have been affected by these shubhat and these ideas is because they are being deliberately promoted and put out there for people to think like that. So for this reason, 
the greatest battle for Muslims today is to primarily uh, have economic strength and use that economic strength to create your own media. You need your own social media. You need your own news channels. You need your own uh, print media. You need your own books. You need your own thinkers, your intellectuals. You need to study Islamic civilization. We need more people, most, m more Muslim youngsters to study the tradition of Islam. Islam is not only reading a tafsir of the Quran and many parli Islam. No, 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 no. It goes a lot further. It goes a lot further. You need to go further. You start, you need to learn Persian. You need to learn Arabic. Arabic more important than Persian, by the way. Arabic first and then Persian. Okay, and it will be, Persian will be a walk in the park for you because you know Urdu, right? Once you know these languages and start to read Islamic literature in these original languages, your dress code, your demeanor, your thinking, your talking, your feeling will change. I can guarantee you that much. It will change completely. You will not even think of atheism or something like in Karul Hadith. Never. Because you have a very strong attachment to your own civilization. In Karul Hadith is something which came from another corner of the world. So people get influenced by the environment, by the conditioning, by the schooling, by the movies you watch, by the literature you read, by the people you listen to, you are being conditioned on a daily basis. So all these new ideas, these questions people pose about the Hadith literature, one of the biggest reasons is that it doesn't make sense. Huh? Have you come across this before? It doesn't make sense. What is it? It's a strange thing. You're talking about the But it doesn't make sense according to what? According to what standard? Have you ever asked that question? It doesn't make sense according to what standard? What tool are you using to measure Islamic civilization or Islamic culture or Islamic way of life? Because if you're using something else to judge Islam, then you are assuming that that system is better than Islam. You are already at fault. You are already at fault. So when the discussion starts, you have already presumed that when you are posing questions about Islam or asking questions about Islam, you have already assumed that your thinking, which has been influenced by another system, is actually the criteria to judge by. Am I making sense? Yes. That's why you have to love Islam, teach Islam, read Islam on its own basis on its own merits, not using something else to judge Islam. This is what happened. So a lot of these questions, for, for example, we talked about causes and reasons that people b become uh, Munkirini Hadith. And by the way, by the way, this is the first step of Shaitan taking you towards ultimately Kufr. Shaitan will ultimately start with casting doubt in your mind because of lack of your because of lack of knowledge because you don't have knowledge you haven't studied history cultures languages so shaitan knows your weaknesses your vulnerability and he will put these ideas in your mind and then the next step will be after in karul hadith is in karul quran after in karul hadith is in karul quran first you have rejected hadith the sunnah of the prophet by due to your conditioning your mental conditioning or maybe if you are not mentally conditioned maybe because of money because you want to be famous or you want you know you want to be controversial you know because agar koi aaj ki duniya mein agar aapne mashhoor hona hai to islam ke upar teer phenko make islam your target and you will become a thinker a philosopher and an intellectual you know even if you have never seen the face of a university you start talking against Islam, you know, like in the West, we have this idiot called Tommy Robinson. Yeah, I don't know if you are watching some of the things that are happening in Britain. This guy cannot put two sentences of the English language without making an error. He's, he's, he claims to be an English man, right? And he has suddenly become a media sensation, of course, for the wrong reasons. But if you want to be famous, start attacking Islam. You want to make money? Suddenly, this guy has become rich. 
This guy, he was put in prison for mortgage fraud. And now he's, he's rich. He's got money for, for some reason. He's flying around, he's doing videos and da -da 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 against Muslims and Islam. Around Europe, all over Europe. Right? So, the point is that if you have been influenced and you ask these questions, uh, then we have to question the criteria, the standard you're using to judge Islam. You have to understand that you have been influenced, you are conditioned. You are asking questions about something you don't understand, you haven't studied. So most of these people when they ask these questions or when they raise these questions about hadith is not because they have thoroughly studied the hadith science. It's not because they have studied the science of Ilm al-Rijal or the science of the mutton analysis of hadith or the science of uh, subtle subtleties of hadith. They haven't studied these sciences. They have no idea what this is, right? There is something else happening in the back of their mind that's, that's driving the attacks on the Hadith literature. So from Hadith rejection comes Quran rejection eventually. That means Islam rejection. You will reject Islam and then you will become a deist who cannot possibly intellectually reject the existence of God. Someone, who out, someone out there who made the universe. But then what will happen is more points will come, more doubts will come in your mind and eventually you will become a God rejected altogether. So step by step, shaitan takes you step by step through these stages. I met a gentleman the other day uh, who is from Pakistan. I'm not going to mention his name. He might know who he is. Um, I had a meeting with him here in Islamabad a few days ago. And he doesn't believe in Islam. He said he became an atheist. First, he became a Hadith rejecter. I asked him a few basic questions about Hadith sciences. And he obviously had no idea. Um, not to belittle him, he was a very intelligent man, no doubt. He was a very intelligent, highly read, uh, highly educated man. Uh, and I was very impressed by his, uh, his uh, intelligence, no doubt. But he had little knowledge on things he had judged. How can you judge something without knowledge, without studying it thoroughly, right? You have no right to judge or have opinions on a science, for example. How many of you are astrophysicists here? Astrophysicists, how many? How many? So do you want me to take you seriously when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, theories on the heavens, for example. If you say something about the solar system, or if you have a theory on the, the origin of the universe, or the Big Bang, there are so many different models of the Big Bang theory, right? Yes? If you start to reject one of them and say, oh, Bakwas model, hai. Kya model, hai? Ye ko model hai? right? And the first question I'll ask you, Kitna padha aapne bhai? how much have you actually studied into astrophysics? Bhai, two four articles. I'll tell you to go home. Ghar jao bhai. Try to cook pakoras and make chart for yourself or something like that. Yeah, but don't have any opinions on astrophysics. The hadith science is no less than that. The science of hadith is a very deep science. Not every Tom, Dick and Harry can deal with it. You need decades of study to understand the intricate details of the hadith science. How uh, the hadith literature has been preserved. So, this gentleman I met, he had very interesting ideas. And he said, first he started with rejecting hadith. And then he became a deist. A deist is someone who doesn't believe in religion. And then he became an atheist. And amazingly from atheist, he became a platonic Christian. Pakistani brother, Urdu speaking, he's a pl platonic Christian. And then I had a very long discussion with him. Uh, how can you be a follower of Plato? Strictly speaking, if you are a pure follower of Plato, you cannot possibly follow Jesus Christ. You have to distort the image of Jesus in order for you to fit him into the pl platonic model. You cannot use pure Jesus, who was a prophet of God with the revelation. Uh, you cannot fit him into platonic model Plato, who was not a prophet. 
right? So we had a very long discussion. From that discussion, I realized this is how shaitan works. First thing is rejecting the sunnah, hadith, right? And this is what hadith rejection leads to very often. It leads to eventually kufr, disbelief in Islam. This is why it needs to be handled before it begins. So inshallah, by the grace of Allah, we will continue with these sessions or these lectures uh, and highlighting some of the shubahat of the hadith rejectors. In the next, next session, we will cover the following points, inshallah. And those points are the doubts raised by hadith rejectors. Some of them, for example, they state that hadith is dhanni knowledge. It is not yaqini. It is dhan. Dhan. You know what dhan is? Yeah. With dha. This is Urdu mein zoi kehte hain. Right? Zoi kehte hain Urdu mein. Right? Alif bete aati hai sabko? Are you sure? Kitne alphabets hain Urdu ke? Bas. Arabi ke kitne alphabets hain? Kitne? Arabi ke chabbi se? Chabbi se hain? Arabi. Urdu ke kitne hain? 36? 29. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I do Tevi hai, Revi hai, Jabi hai. Se to Arabi mein bhi hai. Pe bhi hai. Pe. Pe aur Arabi mein bhi nahi hai. Arabi mein sirf be hai. Haan ji. To the point is ke what were we talking about before we came to alphabet? Haan, dhan. Ek doubt wo raise karte hai ke hadith knowledge is dhanne. is not yaqini. And they take the meaning of dhan as doubt. Amazingly. And they use some Quranic verses to make the point. <coughs> Quran ki kuch ayat hain. Inna ba'da dhan ithmun, for example. Huh? Wo ayat jo hai, kuch jo doubt hai, wo guna hai. They use verses like that. Or a lot of these hadith rejectors, when you start talking to them, even about the Quran, because they are Quran only Muslims. Even the Quran they don't know. Because if they read the Quran carefully, they would have realized that their argument, Quranically speaking, is lame, is absolutely, you know, hilarious. And we will discuss the details in due course, inshallah, in the coming lecture. Another doubt they raise is that uh, Hadith literature is mostly Manawi. Hadith has been paraphrased, for example. These are paraphrased words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi he has not been quoted word by word. Rather, these are all paraphrased reports. Okay, that's another doubt they raise and we will address it uh, 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 briefly to address it very quickly. Uh, Quran ki jo stories and there are stories in the Quran, story of Nuh Alayhi Salaam, story of Yusuf Alayhi Salaam and Musa Alayhi Salaam, all the dialogues, are they paraphrased or are they in the same language um, uh, those prophets spoke? They are paraphrased by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, Musa al Islam didn't speak Arabic, Yusuf didn't speak Arabic, Ibrahim al Islam didn't speak Arabic. So the Quran paraphrased the words of previous prophets. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks the truth. Allah is telling us the story as it happened in the Arabic language. Okay, so there are many more shubhat there is. For example, this was an Ajmi, for example, a non Arabian Persian. Conspiracy to corrupt the message of Islam. That's why so many reports were forged in the name of Rasulullah and they were attributed to the Messenger of Allah. And they give, give an example that most Muhaddisin were actually Ajmis or Persians to be specific, to be precise, right? So they mention the name of Imam Bukhari, Imam Tirmizi, Imam Muslim, and uh, you know. Uh, Imam Abu Dawood, the Sajistani, and da 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 da. But what they do is deliberately, obviously, uh, because they don't know, most of them don't know, um, uh, they ignore all the Arabs, all the Arab Muhaddisin, 
and there's a huge list of them which we will discuss inshallah in the next session in due course and there are many more shubhat they for example hadith was written nearly over two centuries after the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam rasulullah ki do sadiyon baad humne hadith likhi ye kahan se aa gayi bhai information where did sorry that is a most common question exactly one of the most common questions munkareen e hadith ask or uh, those who reject the hadith uh, is that hadith literature was written uh, 200 years after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so therefore it cannot be fully trusted okay hold on a second and then they use the the model of the gospels that you guys are inconsistent you reject the gospels of isa alaihi salam that were written by some people after isa alaihi salam and they were written closer to the time of isa alaihi salam than the hadith was then how can you reject that and accept hadith firstly we don't reject the gospel literature in to- in totality no we don't we believe there are, there, there is there are elements of truth therein there are verses that have been paraphrased uh from the words of Isa alaihi salam right we believe that we don't believe the gospels are entirely false four gospels i'm talking about or the message of Isa alaihi salam is completely lost no that would be rejecting the quran because the quran states that there is truth therein yajiduna hum maktuban indahum fi at-taurat wal injil they find muhammad sallallahu alaihi salam mentioned with them in the torah and injil in the home which is in the hands with them so there is there are verses there about rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay but we respond to these hadith rejectors that there is no comparison between hadith literature and the gospels because we have categories in hadith literature we have sahih okay then we have hasan then we have even hasan ha- is of different types depending on the level of certainty right and then we have uh, daif then we have maudu completely forged lies how do we know by looking at the chain the people who are narrating so our literature depends on people who are narrating publicly they were real figures they existed and they were known publicly and there is evidence for that which we will discuss inshallah taala in due course and imam bukhari when he narrates something from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he doesn't just make it up he doesn't say call rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and doesn't give us the reasons or doesn't give us the chain or the sources he tells us haddathana narrated to us or we were told we were told haddathana haddathani or i was told by my teacher Makki ibn Makki ibn Abi Ibrahim and he was an he narrated from his teacher Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid and he an Salma ibn Al-Aqwa he narrated from his teacher Salma ibn Al-Aqwa who narrated from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so there's a chain bukhari gives the people that this i got my information from Makki ibn Abi, Abi Ibrahim he got his information from Yazid ibn Abi uh, Daud Uh, uh, and he got his information from Salma ibn Al-Aqwa and he got his information from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so there is an uninterrupted chain there is no comparison there is no comparison with the gospels there is in qata in qata in the in the in hadith term- terminology cut off there is a gap between Isa alaihi salam and the people who are writing the gospels of at least at least by the most conservative estimates 30 to 60 years There's no comparison. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin was salatu was salam wa ala khatim al-anbiya wa sayyid al-mursalin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-ghurr al-mayamin wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-din amma ba'd. A'udhu billahi as-sami' al-alim min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin. Wa qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-khulafa. الراشدين المهدين من بعدي او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام respected brothers and sisters thank you so much for attending this lecture today this is the third session on this topic uh, of inkar al hadith i will deliver the lecture in the english language so the wider audience around the world can benefit from this because this idea we are discussing today has spread throughout the planet you will find people in the us in america or in britain in europe 
or even other places around the world, even in Saudi Arabia, where there is uh, an abundance of scholars, even there you'll find some people having these views or they have been affected by these views, uh, the views of uh, Munkareen Hadith in Urdu. We call them Munkareen Hadith or people who reject the authenticity, the validity of Hadith, right? What is Hadith? Hadith is the Sunnah. We use the word Sunnah and Hadith uh, interchangeably, although some people separate the Hadith literature from the concept of the Sunnah. People like Jawed Ahmed Ghamdi, who is a very prominent figure in Pakistan, a lot of uh, uh, liberal thinking people are influenced by his thought and he interprets the Sunnah as the continuous tradition of the Muslims the continuous practice of the Muslims. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left behind companions and then they left behind companions and then they left behind companions and they practiced certain things that have survived to this day and they call it the Sunnah. That is the Sunnah to them, right? However, to us, the people of the Hadith or the people of the tradition, um, we insist that the Sunnah is actually the same thing as the Hadith. Okay, or the Athar, the news, or the reports of the Prophet Sallallahu or reports about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, this topic is very important and that's why we'll address it in the English language so people can actually benefit around the world. Uh, today is the third session. Today we will go directly into uh, the claims or the doubts raised by people who reject Hadith in totality or uh, partially or some do it uh, basically uh, as it comes. So hadith rejection is just uh, is not homogeneous, it's not monolithic, rather it has categories. Some hadith rejectors are complete hadith rejectors. They say hadith is entirely untrustworthy. There's nothing in the hadith literature including the six authentic collections, there's nothing in there that is trustworthy. So that's one category. And they are also known as Ahlul Quran and known also known as Parvezis, right? Then there is another group that rejects Hadith partially. Partially in the sense that they have different reasons to reject Hadith. Some say certain Hadith, they do not um, make sense. They are against common sense or they don't fit into our standard today. They don't make sense to us today, okay? So they don't necessarily reject hadith because of technical reasons documented by hadith scientists. They reject them for their own reasons. For their own reasons. They, their reasons may vary from place to place, from time to time, from person to person. So these are partial rejectors. Some are subtle rejectors who reject hadith subtly. In other words, they will make very strange uh, interpretations. They'll come up with very strange interpretations and meanings of reports. And those, those meanings are far-fetched. Or they will basically make excuses to follow someone, someone else's view over the hadith. That is also a type of hadith rejection, which is a subtle type of hadith rejection, right? When you prefer someone else's words, someone else's ideas over the words of the Prophet Sallallahu having accepted the authenticity, you prefer someone else's ideas or someone else's fatawa or someone else's aqwal upon over the, the words of the Prophet Sallallahu right? And the Quran condemns this attitude. Quran in a number, a number of places clarifies that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the ultimate authority on earth for Muslims. He is the representative of God on earth Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We haven't seen Allah. Allah hasn't come down on earth and that would be beneath the dignity and majesty of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah instead sent down messengers, his slaves, his servants who were sent down by him with special qualities, with a special knowledge, right? 
and we call that revelation. Now, revelations came word by word and also in meaning explaining the word by word revelation. So to us, Quran is the word by word revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hadith is the complementary source Allah sent down, the knowledge Allah sent down on the Prophet to ex explain the Quran as we will see in due course inshallah. So in the previous um, lectures, having clarified the categories of hadith rejectors, people reject hadith in different forms, in different shapes, in different ways. So we are discussing the topic generally. We're not specifically talking about one particular group or one particular type of rejection. We are generally dealing with all the concerns. And hopefully all of them will be covered in this particular session. So in the previous sessions, part one and part two, we discussed the, the underlying philosophies, the underlying reasons of as to why people may reject hadith or the hadith literature or the hadith tradition. We have discussed those in those two previous lectures. So anyone who wants to see why people end up rejecting hadith, what causes them to become what they become, and what is the philosophy behind this rejection? You need to go back to those two lectures, part one and part two. This is part three, going directly to the doubts or the questions raised by Hadith rejectors. So we'll begin with some points, inshallah. There are some important points I want to raise uh, that are very important. Uh, or in fact, let me give you the bullet points I'm going to cover today. So we will be talking about the notion of dhan. Some hadith rejectors bring up this notion of dhan. Dhan with dha. Dha and noon. Okay. Dhan means, generally speaking in the Arabic language, doubt. It means doubt. But that's not the only meaning. That's not the only meaning. There are other meanings of dhan. Sometimes dhan is actually used in the sense to establish certainty. Or it is used for certainty. It is used for yaqeen. Right? So, dhan generally means doubt. And that meaning has been used in the Quran. But there is another meaning used in the Quran where dhan is used, the word dhan is used to describe certainty, yaqeen, as we will see in due course. So, some hadith rejectors bring up this issue of dhan that hadith literature is dhanni knowledge. It is, how can I put it, assumed knowledge. It is not certain knowledge. It doesn't lead to yaqeen. It doesn't lead to certainty. For that reason, because the Quran condemns dhan, we will not accept um, the hadith literature because dhan can never lead to the truth or the haq. And we will see the claims in due course. Then, another point hadith rejectors raise is Deen has been completed. Allah said in the Quran, "Audhu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al yom akmaltu lakum dinakum wa wa admamtu alaykum ni'mati wa radiitu lakum al-Islam adina." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala stated that in Surah Al-Maidah, Deen has been completed, and because Hadith literature came later, it was collected later, and Allah has already completed the Deen before. So hadith literature is not part of the deen. This is another game some hadith literature, uh, hadith rejectors uh, play, and we will address that in due course, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, then another point they bring up is that hadith is mainly rewaya bil ma'na. It has been narrated in meaning, not in wording. Hadith literature is the words of the uh, uh, the words of the Prophet sallam, or his tradition in word uh, sorry in meaning people are describing the actions and the words of the prophet sallam, in their own wording it is paraphrased do you understand it is paraphrased it is not word by word and that's true that's true so for that reason it cannot be trusted because you can never know what the prophet might have really really said sallallahu alaihi wasallam so we will see in due course how uh, shallow this attack is then another idea the hadith rejectors bring up 
very often, very commonly, and it's a classic idea Hadith rejectors might bring up that Hadith literature was collected by a bunch of Iranian uh, or Persian conspirators who wanted to dismantle Islam from within, who pretended to be Muslims and they were in reality storytellers, a bunch of liars, a bunch of hypocrites who attributed lies and stories and fables to the Prophet do you understand this claim? So in other words, because Persia was conquered by the Arabs, so the Persians, some of the Persians had this vendetta against the Arabs. So they came up with this idea to dismantle Islam from within and corrupt Islam or the meaning of Islam or the meaning of the Quran from within. So in other words, Hadith literature is actually the doing of uh, Persian conspirators or, is, or it is a Persian conspiracy to avenge the defeat of the Persian Empire, the Sassanid Empire. Okay, a very interesting claim, uh, a very uh, effective claim in the sense that it has spread. A lot of people have been effective, uh, sorry, affected by it. So we will talk about it today, inshallah ta'ala. And this claim actually comes from uh, some of the 19th century Orientalists, Mustashirqeen. Then we will show that whether major muhaddisin, major collectors of hadith literature, were they actually Arabs or were they a bunch of Persians, as these hadith rejectors have claimed repeatedly. Then another point we will address and look after that some of these reports are contradictory. Some of the reports coming from the Prophet ﷺ are contradictory. They contradict each other and they are spread around. They are spread around. So for that reason, they cannot be fully trusted. Okay. Truth cannot contradict itself, right? So this is another game some of the Hadith rejectors play and we will respond to it inshallah in due course. Then another point they raise is because the literature was written very late, in the 2nd and the 3rd century, this Hadith literature was compiled. For that reason, it can never be trusted or it cannot be trusted. Again, remember, keep in mind that most of these claims are coming from Orientalists writing in the 19th century. Okay, so these claims, which are mainly based upon ignorance of Islamic history and the science of Hadith, were spread by Orientalists like Ignaz Goldzeyer, who was a Jewish Orientalist from Austria, who had traveled to Egypt and studied in Al-Azhar, Al-Azhar University for, for some years. He even used to pray in the mosque, Al-Azhar Mosque, with the Muslims, Ignaz Goldzeyer. In fact, he himself writes in one of his writings that he nearly, he was praying Salah with the Muslims. We don't know whether he was a Muslim at the time or not. But we know he was definitely not Muslim because of his attacks on Islam later on. He said he was praying with the Muslims and he started to cry or he felt like crying in prayer. So even he was aware of the effects of Salah or the Quran. So a lot of these theories come from Ignaz Golzar or Golzir, um, who was a Jewish Orientalist from Austria, who was no doubt a very learned man, but not learned enough to know the answers to these questions. Then another claim we might cover if we get time uh, is the claim that some of the Hadith literature contains um, disturbing content. For example, it accuses prophets of doing certain things that are not very pleasant. For example, the example of Ibrahim as uh, uh, stating three non-factual, um, you know, making three non-factual statements. Uh, there is a hadith in Bukhari. 
he made three non-factual statements and we will come to that inshallah ta'ala and other things in the hadith literature okay and in this you can put all the intellectual problems of modern hadith rejectors that some of the hadith they simply can't accept like the age of Aisha radiallahu anha how can the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam marry a nine years old girl okay and, you, and we have addressed this point extensively in the previous two lectures right so anyone who wants to find an answer to this particular question the age of aisha issue go back to those two lectures inshallah so issues like that okay people have been affected by the modern age by the liberal secular thought and they use the liberal secular lens to criticize the hadith literature so they have assumed that liberal scholars or philosophers who were writing in the 18th century were the standard or are the standard we will use today to look at Islam and other systems. They may not know the lens they are using is actually a liberal secular lens. They may not know because they, they themselves have been affected by this. Liberal secularism, they have been affected by it. Whether they live in Muslim countries or whether they live in Europe or anywhere else for that matter, even in Saudi Arabia, they have been affected by liberalism, wherever the Muslims are, okay? What they don't know is that these liberal ideas actually come from liberal philosophers who are writing in the 18th century. So what they have assumed that people like John Locke or David Hume or Voltaire, right, or Rousseau are the people we will use to judge Islam and other systems, which is a very erroneous assumption. So these are some of the things we'll address today, inshallah. Hopefully we will be able to cover all of them extensively so let's start with the first ones before we start i want to talk about some ideas of the hadith rejectors they said the quran alone is enough for us quran alone quran alone is enough for us yeah quran is the only source of the haq right because quran is what tibiyan and likulli shay quran explains everything as the quran states itself or tafsil and likulli shay quran explains everything this is the idea or these are some of the verses from the Quran hadith rejectors use to claim that Quran alone is enough. We don't need anything outside of the Quran to understand the Quran. Okay, let's assume for a second this idea is valid and reasonable. Let's test it. Number one, Quran states that dead animals, blood, the meat of pig, what we call swine, or animals that are killed in the name of Ghairullah, or any in the name of anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, it are haram. These animals or these things are haram. Yes, Quran has a very clear categoric, categorical verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah on this. Yes. And then Quran tells us generally. Bahimatul an'am, okay, generally these animals, cattle, are halal. And from the Quran, we can understand that this means camels, bulls, goats, or lamb, or sheep. These are the animals. From Bahimatul an'am, we understand that this is what it means, right? Okay, but what about animals the Quran doesn't mention? They're not mentioned in the verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah and they're not part of Bahimatul An'am. So what are these animals? Dog, cat, wolf, lion, tiger, monkey, plenty of monkeys in the Magala Hills. Yeah. And the list goes on. Crows, eagles, falcons. Yeah. List goes on. Are these animals halal? And we don't need your, what we call, akli tukbandi in Urdu language. We don't need your intellectual arguments to tell us whether these animals I mentioned are haram or halal. We need evidence from the Quran. Can I eat tiger? I love tiger. Okay. Tiger is my favorite animal. Okay. Um, and you know, tiger was the, uh, the 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 favorite animal of uh, animal of Tipu Sultan as well. Tipu Sultan on every single thing he had tiger stripes. 
On his flag, tiger stripes. On his swords, tiger stripes. On his guns, guns he produced in Sarangapatam, tiger stripes on the on the barrel. And little tigers made on the barrels and everything. You know, even, even the script, the Persian script he used was called Babri script. You know, it looked like tiger striped, uh, stripes when he wrote. So tiger is my favorite. And can I eat tigers, please? Can you tell me if the tigers are halal or lions or anything else for that matter? That's not mentioned in the Quran. If it is halal, tell me where the Quran says it's halal. If it's haram, tell me where the Quran says it's haram. Okay. And if you don't have answers, then follow the sunnah of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Follow the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that explains that which ones of these animals are halal and which ones of them are haram. Right? So these are some practical problems we face with this view, the Quran only view. Point number two. The Quran commands to pray. salah. Pray. Now, Quran also describes vaguely how to pray. Quran mentions ruku'ah, warka'u ma'arraki'een, or Quran mentions sujood. Yes? When do you make sajda and when do you make ruku'ah? And I don't want your tukbandi, your akli tukbandi or your intellectual arguments. No. Okay? I want it from the Quran. You are Quran only Muslims. If you reject hadith in totality, I want evidence from the Quran. Show me where the Quran says, when you make ruku, when you make sajda, and where is the, the, the order? Okay. And it doesn't end there. How do I make sajda? Where do I place my hands? Where do I place my, do I put my nose first? Do I put my forehead? Do I put them together? Do I put my hands on the floor? Or do I put them in my legs? Or do I put them behind my head? I can do anything, right? Sajda, explain to me how to make sajda. In the Quran, according to the Quran, I need to know how to make sajda and ruku and when to make it, at what point, at what, what place. Point number three, if the Quran only Muslims are taken seriously, then ask them, the Quran commands to give zakat. Yes? Yes? In multiple verses, Quran says give zakat. Pay zakat. Okay? Quran even tells us who to give zakat to. Right? There's a verse that explains who we give to, uh, give, uh, give zakat to. Right? Right? But when do we give zakat? Is it every year? Every day? Every week? Every month? On what quantity do we give zakat? On what quantity? Do you have to be a millionaire? Or do you have to own a small business? Or do you have to own 10 trucks or a car? What do you need to give zakat on? You see the point now? Without the sunnah, without the hadith, these people make the Quran a completely incomprehensible text. A completely impractical text. So... These details are only in the sunnah. So either you tell us how to give zakat from the Quran or zip your mouths or follow the sunnah. Become a brothers, right? I'll need a tea in a minute. So point number four. Quran says when someone steals, someone who steals, a certain amount, uh, you what, what you do is you amputate the hand. It's a very harsh penalty, no doubt. It's a very harsh penalty, but it is a deterrent. It is a deterrent, right? And countries where this law is applied or was applied were the least uh, countries to have suffered from uh, crime of theft. Saudi Arabia was a huge example of that, right? But the question is, if we take, take the Quran only, it says amputate hand of the thief, a professional thief who steals uh, beyond a certain amount of wealth. Even that's a problem now. Uh, if the Quran says, if I steal that tissue, that tissue, okay, I'll pick it up. I'll put it in my pocket, right? I've just stolen a tissue. 
let's assume I've stolen it. Yeah. Although I have the permission of the, the, the Amir of the house to have a tissue in my pocket. Yeah. So do I lose my hand now? According to the Islamic law? Is that fair? Is that reasonable? No. What if I steal a Land Cruiser? Yeah. A Range Rover parked outside. Then you're in trouble. Right according to the Islamic law, where it is applied and when it's applied. Okay, the question is, where do you amputate from? The arm, the elbow, or the wrist? Right? If we leave it to these guys, it can be anything. It can be anything, right? So, certain laws and regulations cannot be understood if we take the Quran only approach. And if we reject the Sunnah or the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that explains the Quran. Point number five, the Quran says when you hear the call to prayer on Jummah, stop your business and go towards Salah. It doesn't say what time. It doesn't say which Salah. Is it Asr? Is it Fajr? Is it Dhuhr or Maghrib or Isha? Which, which Salah? When you hear the call to pray on Jummah, on the day of Jummah, which Salah? So you need to give us reasons from the Quran, tell us which Salah. Okay? If you, and we don't, again, we don't need your intellectual gymnastics. We don't need your intellectual mumbo jumbo. I think maybe, perhaps, however, but none of that. We don't need none of that. We have intellect as well. We can use our brain as well. We need you to show us from the Quran that this time you need to go to the masjid on the day of Juma, or such and such animals are halal or this is how you give zakat we need from the quran now we know that you can never produce it from the quran you can never produce it from the quran because it doesn't exist in the quran these details are not in the quran quran gives pointers quran gives parameters quran points us to directions and the details are given in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thank you, Akhi. Jazakallah khairan. So, having clarified this much, now we know that Quran only approach is not only irrational, it is impractical. It cannot be done. And then eventually it leads to kufr. It leads to disbelief. Because people know this approach is not consistent with the rest of Islamic literature. Now we come to some of the usul of Hadith rejectors, which is very tatty and unfortunately very uh, shallow. What is this usul? They try to base this usul on some of the verses of the Quran, the usul of some of the Hadith rejectors. Okay, or the doubt. Their usul is that deen is haqq. Deen is the truth and it can only be attained, truth can only be attained from certain sources, right? It can only come from Yaqeen. Haq can only come from Yaqeen. And they give this verse from the Quran in Surah An-Nisa, verse 166. This this verse, they give Surah An-Nisa verse 166 as the evidence that deen is haqq and it can only be attained from certain sources, yaqeen. And deen to them, to Hadith rejectors, is generally speaking, and I'm not talking about exceptions, I'm talking generally, this is how they come across. These are their ideas. Deen to them is what Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu brought and what people with him brought. Okay, and it is complete. Al Yawm Akmaltu Lakum Dina Kum Wa Atmamtu Alaykum Nehmati Wa Raditu Lakum Al Islam Adina. Surah Al Maida, verse three. Deen is complete. Okay. Point number three, Asul number three, they have is that Deen is preserved in Lawhun Mahfuz. Bal Hu Quranum Majid Fi Lawhim Mahfuz. Okay, that the Quran is preserved, is protected. And then they state, on the contrary, or to the contrary, Hadith literature is dhanni, it's not yaqini. Okay, and because it's dhanni, it's not yaqini, it cannot lead us to the haqq. 
and deen is haq so it cannot be a source of the deen right and they give many examples in this regard for example there's a verse in surah al-najm verse 28 a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim inna dhanna la yughni min al-haq shay'a that dhan doubt does not benefit for the truth for the haq okay and because deen is the haq so deen cannot be taken from a doubtful source then another verse they present from surah an-najm again surah an-najm verse 23 in yattabi'una illa dhan wama tahwal anfusu wa laqad ja'ahum min rabbihim al-huda okay that they follow nothing but dhan okay and they actually follow their own desires in reality they are following on the desires so they are, these are some of the verses of the quran condemning people following doubts or doubtful matter and following their own desires another example i can give you is surah uh, surah an-nisa where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns the the christians for believing the crucifixion or for the 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 banu israel for claiming that they killed the messiah wa qawlihim inna qatalna al-masih wa ma qataluhu wa ma salabuhu walakin shubbi alahum allah says that they claim that we killed the messiah but he was not killed he was not crucified rather it appeared to them so and they follow nothing in this but dhan they follow conjecture doubt so these are some of the verses these people bring hadith rejectors to say that because hadith is dhanni knowledge okay and this is the meaning they impose on the hadith literature that hadith is doubtful dhan in the science of hadith doesn't actually mean doubtful it doesn't mean doubtful right but they use the science of hadith terminology dhan to take meaning from these verses of doubt okay another verse they bring is from surah al-hujurat verse 12 ya ayyuhal ladina amanu ijtanibu kathiran min adh-dhan inna ba'd adh-dhan ithmun oh you believe abstain from doubtful matters because some of the doubt is sin allahu akbar no dhanni matters are sin so following the hadith is sin to them you understand so this is how they bring these so called evidences now they also claim that and as we have seen i've given you the bullet points we will come to them one by one let's get to the issue of dhan first in sharia this is the response now to these verses and this reasoning in sharia dhan is used for doubt as well as yaqeen it is used for doubt and certainty for example allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the quran in a number of places uses dhan as truth as truth so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah an-nur verse 12 addressing the issue of aisha radhiyallahu anha sabko samajh aa rahi hai meri baat ki ha are you sure yes okay inshallah thank you so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah an-nur addressing the issue of aisha radhiyallahu anha where aisha was accused and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defended aisha allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says laula is samaytu uh, is samaytu muhu dhanna when you heard the 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 rumor okay dhann al-mu'minun wal mu'minat bi anfusihim khairan okay wa qalu hadha ifkun mubin okay when people heard this when you heard this and some believers they assumed good they assumed good about aisha radhiyallahu anha when you heard it why did you not think good of aisha radhiyallahu anha okay so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying laula id sami'tumuhu dhann al-mu'minuna wal mu'minat that when you heard this believers and believing men and believing women why did you not think good in thinking good you know dhan is kam kehte na acha guman 
اردو میں کہتے ہیں تم نے اچھا گمان اپنے ذہنوں میں کیوں نہیں کیا جب نے جب تم نے یہ الزام حضرت عائشہ کے بارے میں سنا اللہ سبحانہ تعالیٰ قرآن میں یہ کہہ رہے ہیں سورت النور میں تم نے اچھا گمان کیوں نہیں کیا وائی ڈن یو تھنک گڈ اباؤٹ عائشہ رضی اللہ عنہ این سے اور اور کہا کہ یہ ایک جو ہے کھلی تہمت ہے اٹ از اے ہیوج لائی اٹ از ناٹ ٹرو اوکے سو ہیئر دن از یوز ان اے ویری پازیٹیو سینس اٹ ڈزن ایکچولی مین ڈاؤٹ اٹ مین اٹ مین اٹ مینس گڈ اسمپشن اٹ مینس گڈ از اسمپشن وچ مینس گمان ان اردو لینگویج Another verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 45 and 46, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word dhan in another meaning than doubt. وَاسْتَعِينُ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاءِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ الَّذِينَ يَذُنُّونَ الَّذِينَ يَذُنُّونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاكُ رَبِّهِمْ مُلَاكُ رَبِّهِمْ وَأَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Okay, so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Uh, seek help of, of, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through patience and salah. وَاسْتَعِينُ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهُ لَكَبِيرَةٌ Okay. وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ الَّذِينَ يَذُنُّونَ Except for those who are khashi'een, who are diligent in their reverence to, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who يَذُنُّونَ who think, who have a belief. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the word or uses the meaning of dhan in belief. Who believe annahum mulaku rabbihim that they will meet their Lord one day. Okay. Who are the khashi'een? According to the Quran, people who will, who believe and believe what? Is this belief weak or strong? Ke hum apne rab se milenge qiyamat ke din. Hamari apne rab se mulaqat hogi qiyamat ke din. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is yakin ko, yakin ko Allah ta'ala جو ہے وہ ان الفاظ میں بیان کرتے ہیں اور اللہ تعالیٰ یادنون کا لفظ استعمال کرتے ہیں ان ادر ورڈس دس کین آلسو بی مین یوز ایز یقین ایز سرٹنٹی سو دوز ہو آر سرٹن ٹو میٹ دے لارڈ اکارڈنگ ٹو دس ورس دوز ہو آر سرٹن ٹو میٹ دے لارڈ سو ان ادر ورس آف دا قرآن ان متفین صورت المتفین ورس فور ورس فائیو اللہ یادن کا انہم مبعوثون لیومن عظیم اوکے دیٹ کیا وہ لوگ دن نہیں رکھتے کہ وہ ایک بڑے دن کے لیے اٹھائے جائیں گے یہاں دن سے کیا مراد ہے کیا لوگ یہ وہ لوگ یقین نہیں رکھتے کہ وہ ایک دن اٹھائے جائیں گے ڈو دے ناٹ بلیو دیٹ دے ول بی ریزریکٹیڈ ون ڈے ان دس ورس اللہ از یوزنگ دا ورڈ دن فار یقین ناٹ دا وے منکرین حدیث اور دا حدیث ریجیکٹر یوز اٹ ٹو میک دے تھرٹی پوائنٹس or the lame points to accuse or to claim that hadith is dhanni knowledge. So here dhan is actually used for yaqeen. So their use of the verses of the Quran to claim that hadith is dhanni knowledge and dhan cannot be taken into consideration as haq, then what are you going to do with these verses? What are you going to do with these verses of the Quran where Allah is using the word dhan as yaqeen interchangeably? Yaqeen and dhan is the same thing. In these verses, and there are many more examples I can give in this regard. I do not have time. There are plenty of examples. I'll simply give you the verses so that you can go and check yourself. Go and check the verse number 19 to 22, Surah Al-Haqqa, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inni dhanantu anni mulaqin hisabiya, that I, mein zan rakta ta ke mein apne hisab se milunga. that I used to have this belief that I will re- meet my accountability on the Day of Judgment. So here again, dhan is used for yaqeen in the Quran. And then there is another verse, Surah, Surah Saad, okay, verse 24. وَظَنَّ دَعُودُ أَنَّمَا فَتَنَّهُ اور ایون ان دس ورس اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی is using دعود نے یہ ذن کیا کہ ہم نے اسے آزمائش میں ڈال دیا. ڈال دیا پس انہوں نے اپنے رب سے مغفرت مانگی اور رکو کرتے ہوئے گر پڑے اور اللہ کی طرف جھک گئے داؤد علیہ السلام ہی تھاٹ ہی بلیوڈ دیٹ اللہ سبحانہ تعالیٰ ہیز پٹ ہم ان اے ٹیسٹ سو 
Again, in Surah Al-Baqarah 230, same word is used in similar fashion. In Surah Tawbah, verse 118, same word, dhan, is used for yaqeen or for belief or for stating facts or stating truth. So here, munkirini hadith or hadith rejectors, when you use the term dhan to cast doubts on the hadith literature and they use the Quran to make this point, they are very inconsistent. In fact, they are lying to you. If they know the Quran, then they are a bunch of liars. If they know the Quran, and unfortunately, the, 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 the reality is a lot of them don't actually know the Quran. They call themselves Quran only Muslims, but most of them have very little knowledge of the Quran. Okay, because if they are using the Quran to cast doubts on the Hadith because it is dhanni knowledge, it is not yaqeeni, okay, then they are being inconsistent because the Quran uses the term dhan for yaqeen also, right? So to be consistent, you have to stick to the Quran and use the Quran consistently. Now, as for the completion of deen, right? Deen has been completed. You know, they make another point that deen has been completed and deen was completed early. Surah Tul Ma'idah was revealed near the end of the Prophet's life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the term they use or the verse they use in this regard is in Surah Al-Ma'idah that Allah has completed our religion. That today we have perfected your religion for you. We have completed it and your deen is complete. So because deen has been completed near the end of the Prophet's life, Hadith literature came later. We don't need it. Deen is complete. Okay. Okay. Do you understand the claim? Then we go back to them and ask them the same questions. If the deen is complete, as you claim, without the sunnah, without the hadith literature, if the deen is complete, then tell us how to give zakat. Tell us how to pray our salah. Tell us how to make sajda according to the Quran because deen is complete. So put hadith aside, throw it on the wall. Now you need to explain to us from the Quran how to pray, how to give zakat, okay? And which animals are halal other than uh, bahimatul anam, which animals are halal? So again, they get stuck on this question. They simply cannot give you any answers from the Quran, okay? So this argument falls on its face. <clears throat> and Quran also states, let's assume Quran is the completion. Quran, Quran in itself states, in many places that Rasulullah sallallahu is your model. They claim deen is complete, which is true. Of course, we believe that. We believe deen is complete. Okay. But complete how? Is it only the Quran or there is another source of understanding the Quran? Okay. So we ask them when Allah says in the Quran, Audhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Laqad kana lakum fi Rasulillahi uswatun hasana. In Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 21, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in him you will find a perfect model to follow. Now, have you seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Have I? Have you, sisters? No, we haven't seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how do we apply this verse in our lives? How do we follow this verse? Laqad, laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana. So this verse doesn't apply to us. It only applies to those who are alive, right? But then their understanding is wrong because it is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah is talking about. His actions, his words and his instructions have been preserved for us to follow. So we follow them. That's when these verses make sense. When Allah says, Allah, Ya amanu, wa rasul wa ulil amri minkum, fa in tanazatum fi shayin, farudduhu ilallah wa rasul. Yes? Now, I'm asking these hadith rejectors, the Quran only Muslims, 
show me how to go to the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we know how to go to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how do we go to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how 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 do we go to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the quran says oh you believe atti allah wa atti ur rasul obey allah and obey his messenger obey allah and obey his messenger wa ulil amri minkum and those who are influential among you those who are influential among you powerful influential or knowledgeable among you right ulil amr means those who have the amr those who have the influence upon you follow them minkum means from you among you from the believers from the muslims because the verse starts with the wording ya ayyuhal ladina amanu right you see when uh, in the 19th century mirza ghulam ahmed qadiani he started to ask the muslims to follow the british raj taaje bartaniya ke ghulam ban jao maghrib shall we stop and uh, take q and a after maghrib and do another session part 4 kyunki abhi to I'm second point pe you see last week i was talking about this that once we start to go into the details it gets bigger so let, let, let give me a few minutes and inshallah i'll summarize this point with so mirza ghulam ahmed qadiani he started to advise muslims to uh not oppose the british rule in india and accept queen of victoria as the rightful ruler of india and the verse he used was this one atiullah wa atiur rasul wa ulil amri minkum okay you see every person who twists a verse to suit his agenda whether it it is political or theological whoever twists the verse is not able to do it because the quran is so powerful you cannot twist it possibly because the quran the verse starts with ya ayyuhal ladina amanu a iman walo minkum minkum so follow those who are from among you queen victoria ko hamari chaati thi that's the question was queen victoria from us she was an outsider right in fact she never you know she was so scared of coming to india have you seen this recent movie victorian abdul has anyone seen it Victorian Abdul you have to watch it it's a, it's a, it's an amazing uh movie it's factual it's based uh, upon facts and this story for amazing reasons for some amazing reasons or amazingly it was hidden for the last 130 years from everyone Queen Victoria had come so some come has come so close to a muslim servant and she treated him like his uh, sorry her own son that she was actually learning the quran from him he was teaching her urdu so you have to watch this movie called Vic- victorian abdul it's historical so it will it is a source of knowledge you can it's a depiction of historical events so you can watch it as a source of knowledge inshallah okay as a source of history so you cannot twist these verses here allah says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu atiu allah wa atiu rasul wa ulil amri minkum then the next part is very important that dismantles the quran only muslim understanding fa in tanaza'tum fi shay'in if you differ in a matter with each other if you clash with each other tanaza'a tanaza'a wo jisko hum apni zuban mein tanaza'a kehte hain zameen ka tanaza'a ho gaya right ہماری اردو میں بھی کہتے ہیں نا رائٹ فان تنازعتم في شيء فردوه الى الله ورسوله then refer back to allah and his messenger acha we know how to refer back to allah is the quran is the quran how do we refer back to allah agar aap aur mujh mein aaj tanaza ho jaye khuda na khwasta if me and you today have a disagreement between each other we can refer back to allah by looking at the quran how are we going to refer back to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam how he's not among us sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
So how will we apply the second, the latter part of the verse? فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُ That's another part. Then, another verse in Surah Al-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ That they will not by Allah, by your Lord, Fala wa Rabbika. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Muhammad, by your Lord. Yani Allah is talking about Himself in the Quran. O Muhammad, Allah has never sworn like that in the Quran. Fala wa Rabbika. O Muhammad, by your Lord. They will never believe. Ye mumin kabi ni ho sakte. La yu'minuna. Until they make you a judge in their affairs. How are you going to make him judge today? Rasulullah is not alive among us. But his sunnah is living. His hadith is living. And this is how we use the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to judge in our affairs, the hadith literature. This is how these passages of the Quran are understood. This is the only way to understand them. There is no other way. Otherwise, they don't make sense. Rasulullah is not alive today. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah told us in the Quran, Innahum mayyatun wa innahum. Innahum mayyatun wa innahum mayyatun. Yehi verse, na? Yehi alfaz hai? Sorry, inna ka mayyatun wa inna hum mayyatun. Sorry, yeah. Inna ka mayyatun wa inna hum mayyatun. Okay, you will die, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aapko mawt aayegi. Quran ke alfaaz hai. Clear cut. O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, aapko mawt aayegi. Wa inna hum mayyatun. Or unko bhi mawt aayegi. Aapke sahaba ko ya aapke jo jo dushman hai, ye isme ikhtilaf hai, inna hum ke baare mein mufasarin ka ikhtilaf hai, yahan bar kis ke baare mein guftugo ho rhi hai, lekin inna ka ke baare mein koi ikhtilaf nahi hai, Allah ke nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wafat pa chukhe hai, humare haan, humare saab mujood nahi hai, aur jo loog kehte hai ke wo unki mehflo mein aate hai, Allah hi unko hidayat dhe, Hazrat Ali ki jang hoi Hazrat Aisha ke saath, us fakt Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam unko, yani us fakt aate hai Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وہ ان کے معاملات کو درست کرتے رائے حضرت علی کی جانگوی حضرت معاویہ کے ساتھ اس وقت رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم حضرت کتنے معاملات ہوئے بعد میں لیکن آج کے دور میں یہ ہمارے چھوٹے چھوٹے مولوی بیٹھے ہوتے ہیں مساجد میں وہ کہتے ہیں جی یہاں پر ہمارے پاس رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم تشریف لا رہے ہیں وہ اس کرسی پر تشریف رکھیں گے تو سوچنے کی بات ہے کوئی اتنے ظالم نہ بنو کچھ تو مروت سیکھو غالب وہ شیر سنا ہے تم پر مرتے ہیں تو ماری ڈالو گے کیا ہمیں اتنے ظالم نہ بنو کچھ تو مروت سیکھو غالب رائٹ سو اتنی دور مت جاؤ قریب قریب رہو اسلام کے سنت کے قریب قریب رہو انشاءاللہ فائدہ اٹھا ہوگے سو the point is that رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم is a living model for us today صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم and he is a living model for us today through his سنہ the hadith literature that describes how he walked, how he talked, how he ate, how he sat, how he prayed, how he gave zakat, how he killed animals for food, which animals are halal, which are not halal, how to apply law, how to practice law, how to be kind and compassionate, how to behave in conflict. All of these things are in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There is no other way to know them. The Quran doesn't give us the details about the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Then in, in another verse, and I'm going to make this point the last point for tonight, inshallah. And uh, uh, we will have to continue for part four. Uh, because if I continue tonight, uh, we'll be here till... 10 o'clock right so i don't think that's a good idea um we'll stop here pray maghrib inshallah come back to q a and end is that okay with everyone yes
I hope, I wished I could cover more, but these points are very important and they need detailed treatment. So the last point, Surah Al-Nahal, uh, there's a verse in Surah Al-Nahal, if I'm not mistaken, is Surah Al-Nahal verse 44. Can you please check if it's the verse 44, Surah Al-Nahal, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, uh, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ ہم نے تم پر ذکر نازل کیا ہم نے تم پر ذکر نازل کیا تاکہ تم بیان کر دو لوگوں کے لیے کہ اللہ نے تم پر کیا نازل کیا کہ اللہ نے تم پر کیا نازل کیا We have revealed the dhikr upon you so that you may explain to people what Allah has revealed upon them or for them. So this verse is categorically telling us that there is an extra Quranic material explaining the Quran. Allah is telling us in black and white that we have revealed the dhikr upon you so that you may explain to people what has been revealed upon them. So if the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is explaining the revelation to us, the question is, where is that explanation today? It is not in the Quran because Allah is not talking about the Quran. Allah is talking about the explanation of the Quran made by the Prophet وسلم. The question is, where is that explanation today? Nowhere else, nowhere other than the hadith literature, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. rahman rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah mabad. Audu billahi samir alim in ash-shaytan rajim Bismillah rahman rahim Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lila alameen. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-khulafa al-rashidin al-mahdin min ba'di. Aw kama qal alayhi salatu wa salam. Respected brothers and sisters, we were previously discussing uh, some of the shubhat, some of the doubts raised by hadith rejectors, people who reject hadith, uh, whether they reject hadith in totality, or whether, do it, whether they do it partially, or whether they do it subtly or openly. We are talking about uh, some of the ideas made public by hadith rejectors. So we were discussing the issue where some hadith rejectors claim that the deen is complete, and because the hadith literature was compiled later on, Although the reality, the origin is early, uh, it goes back to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu But they claim that it originated late, so that's why it has nothing to do with the deen. And we already highlighted our response. We already gave our response in the previous um, section. Now we will move on to the next point, which is another point hadith rejectors raise, that hadith literature is mainly rewaya bil ma'na. It has been transmitted in um, meaning, not word by word. And that is true. Hadith literature we have today, the authentic Hadith literature, the six books, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Daud, Tirmizi, uh, Sunan al-Nisai, Ibn Majah, even Imam Malik's Mu'atta or Sunan al-Darami, uh, whatever collection you might pick up majority of the reports therein are reported by meaning in other words the companions of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are describing the life of the prophet or the words of the prophet in their own wording so it's mostly paraphrased the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are paraphrased so what we look for is the crux what we look for the, uh, is the crux of the matter. So if five companions are reporting the same incident in different wording, the conclusion we reach is that the incident definitely took place. There is no doubt because there are five different companions reporting the same incident, right? Reports coming from the, from the Prophet Sallallahu word by word are very few in numbers. One of them is, for example, man kadiba alayya muta'ammidan fal yatabawwa maka'adahu minan nar. Anyone who lies on me deliberately, let him take his seat in hellfire. This is 
what the Prophet said word by word. Okay, it has reached us word by word. It is there in our authentic literature. Other reports in Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmizi, even Majah have been reported uh, in a paraphrased form. Bil Ma'na and the companions of the Prophet have reported those uh, events, incidents or ideas in their own words. So Hadith rejectors, they claim that because this literature is Bil Ma'na or uh, Riwaya Bil Ma'na, we cannot fully trust it. But this notion is very erroneous, even according to the Quran. Let me explain again. In the Quran, in the Quran, we have stories of the prophets. Yes, is that true? We have the story of Moses, we have the story of Jesus, we have the story of Abraham, we have the story of Dawood and Suleiman. Now, as far as I know, none of these prophets spoke the Arabic language. Yes, none of these prophets spoke the Arabic language. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes those incidents in the Arabic language where? In the Quran. So when Allah says, وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what Isa alayhi, Isa alayhi salam said to his people. Who were they? Banu Israel. Allah tells us, وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ أُعْبُدُ اللَّهَ رَبِّي وَرَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Subhanallah, I've forgotten the verse. وَمَأْوَاهُنْ نَارِ وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ Yes, that's it. Okay, so Allah tells us that Isa a.s. said this. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ And Allah tells us that Jesus said this. Did Jesus, spoke, uh, did, did Jesus speak the Arabic language? No. So we know that Jesus did not use these words. He did not speak the Arabic language. So Allah is paraphrasing the words of Isa a.s. In other words, so long as you are telling the truth and you're not adding details or attributing false information to a prophet or someone truthful, then it is okay. Then it is fine. Because this is exactly what Allah does in the Quran. Allah tells us what Isa a.s. said, what Musa said, what Ibrahim said, what Daud said. Okay? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many incidents in the Quran where Allah paraphrased the words of previous prophets. So if there's no problem with that, why is there a problem with companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa paraphrasing the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And in the end, they would qualify themselves. They would say, Oh, kama qal alayhi salatu salam, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said something like this. He said something like this. For example, if a Sahabi, if a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if a disciple of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he attributes information to the Prophet and he says that Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsihi aw kama qal alayhi salatu salam they would state a report from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this and then in the end the Sahabi or the companion or the disciple of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say Oh, kama qal alayhi salatu salam. He said something like this to qualify himself, to save himself from an error, right? So when five or ten companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi are reporting the same thing, then it becomes absolutely certain that this report or this particular narration is definitely authentic as far as the uh, the main details are concerned, right? So reliable mana is absolutely trustworthy, especially when you have multiple attestation, when you have multiple companions saying the same thing. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with that. So that was the response. Now coming to the Persian conspiracy. Point on Persian conspiracy. Some of the Hadith rejectors, they claim that Hadith literature was collected by a bunch of conspirators who were 
originally Persian and they were a bunch of storytellers and liars and because they were so used to, to telling stories about Rustam and Nosherwan and Asfandiyar and these Persian fables of the past they knew how to forge these new stories about the Prophet and they attributed these stories to the Prophet and spread them. This is the, the, the jahil and ignorant and absolutely erroneous notion of storytelling they spread the hadith rejectors I'm talking about they spread about the hadith literature anyone who studies the hadith science even on a basic level on the primary level will come to realize that it would be impossible it would be impossible for one to forge a lie about the Prophet وسلم, uh, at that time and not get caught how do we know people got caught? Because we have been told by the Muhaddisin that people were lying on the Prophet and we caught them. They were lying on the Prophet and we, we caught them. So what these people do is, they, the people they called Iranian conspirators are the ones who are actually catching thieves. So imagine if a thief runs into your house and you catch him. And then people come, come from outside and they say, the thief is the thief and you are also a thief. Because, yeah, we are the one who caught him. We are the one who telling you he's the thief. No, because he is in your house, you caught him, you are also a thief. Or imagine if police catches a thief. Police catches a thief. And you go to the police and you say, uh, you are also a thief. Right? Although it may be true in many cases in Pakistan. Yeah? But generally, in other places, it's not true. Okay, so the policeman will say to you, hold on a second, I'm the one who caught him. I'm the one who's telling you he's a thief. So this is what these people who, have, who, who are completely void of justice, unfortunately, they are telling the muhaddisin that you are the thieves. They are accusing muhaddisin, people who collected the sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, that you are the thieves amazing amazing standards okay and this is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses in the quran when allah says kaburat kalimatan takhruju min afwahihim in yaquluna illa kadhiba that they lie they spread nothing but lies okay these people the hadith rejectors about great personalities we haven't made these stories up these muhaddisin who gave sacrifices and who had very diligent criteria to accept these reports from certain people and when they doubted someone's character liars were out of the question anyone who has known to have lied or who, who was known to have lied once in his life was never accepted as a hadith narrator for the hadith collectors anyone who had other weaknesses in his character was also not accepted as a hadith narrator Someone who had weak memory, someone who was known to have mixed reports with each other, khalas, out, we, we don't, we cannot take a risk. This is how the muhaddisin treated people. If people were known to have had mixed reports, once, one mistake is enough for the muhaddisin, for people like Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam Abu Dawood, Imam Ahmad, Imam Shafi'i, if you were known once to have made a mistake, you would be not, be, not you're not written off from Islam. Now, you may be a very good Muslim, but you cannot give us the Hadith literature. We will not take it from you because we cannot risk. We cannot take a risk on our deen. This is how diligent they were in collecting Hadith. Muhaddisin radiallahu anhum ajma'in. May Allah be pleased with them and may Allah accept their efforts. And most people who accuse them of this erroneous idea that they were conspirators or they were collecting uh, just piles of literature, piles of stories, and they were just attributing these stories without checking them uh, to the Prophet. Wasallam, how can you claim that? Especially when you haven't studied the science of hadith. It is absolutely appalling to claim something like that and we will show how. First of all, 
the fact that when they claim that these muhaddisin most of them were persian and this was a persian conspiracy to corrupt islam from within hence the hadith literature this idea in itself is false because most of the major muhaddisin the first narrators who were they who were they the first narrators were the companions of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were if not all majority the overwhelming majority of them were arabs they were from the arabian peninsula right and then main narrators are after them who were they imam al-zuhri imam al-zuhri imam saeed bin musayyib urwa bin zubair umar bin abdul aziz these people right who were they they were arabs they were all arabs okay so they are the ones who took hadith from the companions of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam urwa bin zubair who was he who was he urwa bin zubair who was he he was the son of zubair bin awam okay and also a nephew of aisha radhiyallahu anha that's why he narrated so much from aisha radhiyallahu anha urwa was a nephew of aisha so he was very close to aisha khala she was his khala so he would go to her and take hadith from her imam zuhri took from urwa right and then imam zuhri gave to later people imam malik for example who was also an arab imam malik took from nafi nafi was a direct student and a servant of abdullah bin umar an arab abdullah bin umar was a companion of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and malik gave hadith to abdullah bin yusuf another man abdullah bin yusuf was the teacher of imam bukhari where is the lie where is the persian conspiracy where is the imam bukhari was not persian by the way imam bukhari was from mawra un nahar transoxania transoxania is basically beyond the river oxus land beyond the river oxus which is central asia today he was from bukhara which is in uzbekistan right so it was not uh, strictly speaking persia so imam ahmed al hanbal imam al shafi both arabs imam malik uh, was from the tribe of asbah imam shafi he was qureshi imam ahmed al hanbal was from the tribe of shayban okay and it was the tribe of shayban amazingly now this is where the 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 error of these people the ignorance of these people is who claim this persian conspiracy uh, in the form of hadith literature hadith rejectors amazingly who is the madar the center of hadith literature in iraq in baghdad in the second century hijri who is it imam ahmed bin hanbal Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal is the main, one of the main, not the main, one of the main teachers of hadith in Baghdad from the tribe of Shayban. And to this day, which hadith book is the largest collection of hadith? One, sorry? Say Bukhari. Anyone else? Anyone else? It is Musnad of Imam Ahmad. The Musnad of Imam Ahmad is the largest collection of hadith available to us today. And Imam Ahmad was one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari. He was also uh, one of the teachers of Imam Abu Dawud, also Imam Muslim. They were contemporaries. It was the idea of Imam Ahmad to filter out the most authentic literature, making sure that we have one or two authentic collections of the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu that cannot be doubted not even 1% doubt should be on them right because they are the ones who started catching thieves imam ahmed was the policeman he was the policeman he was the inspector general of the hadith literature he was the man who was appointed to catch thief by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he started to catch thieves and then he realized that the treasure the purity of the treasure 
جس کو ہم خزانہ کہتے ہیں اردو میں یہ خزانہ اس اس کا اس کا جو آ, اس کی جو پیورٹی ہے خالص کو کیا کہیں گے اردو میں خالص ہی ہے نا ہاں جی پیور چلو خزانہ جو ہے دس ٹریجر اس پیورٹی از ان ڈینجر ڈیو ٹو دا تھیوس ڈیو ٹو دا تھیوس بیکاز تھیوس مے بی تھروئنگ فیک جیمز ان ٹو دا ٹریجر فیک جیمز اے روبی دیٹ لکس لائک این اوریجنل روبی اف از تھرون ان ٹو اے ٹریجر اے پائل آف ٹریجر ہاؤ یو گین اے سیپریٹیڈ ہاؤ یو گین اے سیپریٹیڈ اونلی اے جوہری اونلی اے جیولر اور اے جیمز ایکسپرٹ کین سیپریٹیڈ رائٹ ڈی اگری ریسنٹلی مائی فادر بوٹ اے روبی اینڈ از ویری ہیپی اباؤٹ اٹ اینڈ اٹ واز اے بگ روبی ہے اینڈ اٹ لکس سو بیوٹیفل It's so clear. I said, you know what? It looks, and I'm not a gem ex- gems expert. I said, you know what? It looks too good to be true. It looks too good to be original. I cannot believe such a big ruby, such a clear ruby can be for such 7,000 rupees. I said, I don't get 7,000 rupees of real ruby. He goes, no, no, it's real. So we took it to the gem, gem experts. They said, Bhai sahab, this is shisha. This is glass. They said, this is glass. Someone has robbed you. Right? So, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal was that inspector, that policeman appointed by Allah to guard the treasure of the sunnah. And when people were throwing, start, th- trying to throw fake gems inside the treasure to compromise its purity he appointed other policemen jisko kehte hain nafri badha do pakistan ki zuban mein kehte hain jahan par threat zyada hoti hai kehte hain nafri badha do ha police ki nafri badha do isliye aapke jo jalse hote hain siyasatdanon ke to police gayab ho jati hai pure shehar se kyunki unki nafri badh jati hai so increase the numbers of guards lock the treasure and increase the number of guards so that thieves cannot throw in fake gems it's not about taking gems from the treasure it's not about that it's about mixing or you know compromising the purity of the treasure we want to keep this treasure pure so he said increase the number of gods so imam ahmed al humble bukhari muslim abu daud nasai tirmizi dar qutni later on ibn khuzaima ibn abdul bar baki bin makhlad in spain In Al-Andalus, Imam Ahmed's student, Allahu Akbar, you name it, one after another, guards are arising and they are protecting the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. Do you, do you think this is a joke? This science is a joke? Do you think it was just collected and put together by random guys who thought, oh, this or this looks nice, so we'll put it in the collection? No, no. They scrutinized every single narrator in the chain, every single man. And the point I want to make is that this inspector general, Imam Ahmed al-Hambal, was from Banu Shaiban. So if it was a Persian conspiracy, Banu Shaiban was the tribe that was on the front line fighting the Persians. Amazingly. Militarily, when the Muslims attacked Persia in the time of Umar bin Khattab, an, you know which tribe was on the front line fighting the Persians? Banu Shaiban and even in the second century if anything it is Banu Shaiban a man from Banu Shaiban Shaibani Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal al-Shaibani yeah is defending the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam if there are any persian attacks but there were none this notion was actually introduced by Ignaz Goldzeyer in the 19th century and some hadith rejectors to sound cool or to look cool or to come across intellectuals as intellectuals or to, or to look like uh, educated people, they started to adopt these theories. And you know what? Most of them haven't studied the science of Hadith. It is very clear. So having clarified that, Imam Bukhari was from Turkestan, Mawar nahar He was not Persian. Imam Daud, his, uh, he came from Sajistan, which was not, strictly speaking, part of Persia. 
Okay. Um, and Imam at Tirmizi was again uh, Tirmiz today you can I think it's in Iran but at that time it wasn't strictly speaking part of Persia and then we look at the names of some of the major authorities of hadith who were directly responsible for collecting hadith literature from earlier generation and then generation before that which was Tabi'in and then Ashab Rasul. Who are these people? Imam Malik. Imam Malik, he collected one of the first collections of hadith called Al Mu'atta. Al Mu'atta. Okay. Who was Malik? Was he Persian? No. He was from the Asbah. Okay. His tribe was called the Asbah. He was an Arab. He was an Arab. He died in 179 Hijri. He was born in 94 Hijri Rahmatullahi alayhi. and in fact between him and a companion of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how many people how many one man Nafir Nafir okay then Imam Shafi'i Imam Shafi'i Qurayshi he died in 204 Hijri he was a direct student of Imam Malik Imam Humaydi died in 219 Hijri Qurayshi Imam Ishaq bin Rahwe, Banu Tamim, died in 238 Hijri, a teacher of Imam Bukhari. Imam Ishaq Rahwe was one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari from Banu Tamim. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, as we have discussed, who died in 241 Hijri, Banu Shaiban. Imam Darimi, or Darimi, who died in 255 Hijri, Banu Tamim. Imam Muslim, 261 Hijri, Banu Qushair. Okay, Arab. Imam Abu Dawud, 275 Hijri, he was from Banu Azd. Now, you may be thinking, Imam Abu Dawud was from Sajistan. Sajistani. He's, also, he's known as Abu Dawud as Sajistani. Okay, now this doesn't mean that he was actually originally from Sajistan. Sajistan is basically close to Balochistan, this, this region. Okay, um, so do. Keep in mind that when the Islamic conquest took place, a lot of the Arabs resettled in these conquered lands. Does that make sense? Right? And these Arabs became Persianized. They became Persianized. So they were originally Arabs, but they had also learned the Persian language and adopted some of the Persian culture. But they were actually Arabs. And one example is Imam Abu Dawud, who was born in Sajistan, but he was actually originally from Banu Azd, an Arabian tribe. Imam Tirmizi who was also again born very close to Persian territory, Tirmiz. Okay, again he was from the Arab uh, Arabic uh, origin. He was from Banu Sulaim. Haris, Imam Haris bin Abi Usama, who died in 282 Hijri, Banu Tamim. Imam Abu Bakr. Bazar, okay, who died in 292 Hijri, Banu Azd, Imam Abu Ya'la, Imam Abu Ya'la from Banu Tamim, who died in 307, Imam Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, Imam al-Tahawi, okay, you know Aqidah al-Tahawiyah, you know Aqidah al-Tahawiyah, we read Aqidah al-Tahawiyah, yeah? it was written by, compiled by Imam al-Tahawi, Imam al-Tahawi, also the author of Sharh, Mushkil al-Athar, Okay, this big compendium of book. I mean, I'm going to come to address this point. So remember, remember the name Imam al tahawi Okay, he died in 321 Banu Azd. He was also an Arab. Imam Ibn Hibban, Banu Tamim. Okay, Imam al tibrani Banu Lakhm. Okay, Imam Hakim, Banu Dhabba. Okay, and those who were Ajmis, mainly some of the major muhaddisin who were Ajmis, non-Arabs, were Imam Ibn Abi Shayba, the author the compiler of Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, okay? Imam Bukhari also was non-Arab. Imam Ibn Majah was also non-Arab, okay? Imam Ibn Khuzayma was non-Arab. So major authorities of Hadith, the majority of them were Arabs. So this Persian conspiracy theory in itself is a conspiracy. You understand? This Persian conspiracy theory 
on the part of hadith rejectors in itself is a conspiracy to cast doubts on hadith literature in fact there's a book i strongly recommend uh, by sheikh zayuddin islahi uh, it has been published from azamgarh india and it is called tazkiratul muhaddithin okay it is in two volumes and it covers the history of muhaddithin from the second century in fact the first century to the eighth century hijri okay read this two these two volumes and the majority of the muhaddithin major authorities were mostly arabs okay <coughs> let's assume that these people who claim the persian or ajmi conspiracy to corrupt the arabi religion al-islam okay who are these people who are claiming this conspiracy? Who are these people? They themselves are Ajmis. They themselves are Ajmis. Parvez, Parvez, the, the founder of Parvezi Firka. Who was he? Was he an Arab? Ajmi. Javed Gandhi. Although he's from, he's from Gandhi tribe. I don't know if the attribution is correct or not. Yeah. But I can't call him. But by culture, by upbringing, he's Ajmi, right? He may be originally Arab because Gandhi, Gandhi is a Saudi tribe. It is an Arabian tribe. Okay. Who are these people? They themselves have been affected by an Ajmi conspiracy or Ajmi um, theory. So another question I want to ask is why did it take the Persians so long to come up with this conspiracy if it's a conspiracy? Why did it take them two, three centuries? Right, and all the Muslim scholars were deaf, dumb, and blind. For the last 14 centuries, they had no idea that this conspiracy had happened. They were all sleeping, and suddenly these these rejectors, pseudo intellectuals, woke up in the 19th century and beyond and realized that there was a Persian conspiracy. All oh, that Islam, jo hai, Persian, <laughs> ek jo hai, Farsi sajish ka shikar ho gaya. Right? Islam ek Farsi sazish ka shikar ho gaya. Islam ka beda gar kar diya Farsiyo ne. Right? Inko aaj koi wahi nazil hoi hai 19 sadi mein aur 20 sadi mein. They have come to realize. Pichle jo muhaddisin te sab bilkul farik te. Yani they had no idea what was happening with them in their history. They had no idea. So this is why, refer back to our first lecture where I said, one of the biggest causes of hadith rejection is actually absolute ignorance of the science of hadith and the history of hadith and the history of the muhaddisin and the history of the men who are narrating hadith this is the biggest reason why people become hadith rejectors because they assume that it is just ami is just you know random knowledge that was collected by Muhaddisin uh, on ad hoc basis. It wasn't like that. It was systematic. It was very organized. It was very, very delicate. It was very, very um, intricate work which the Muhaddisin did. And the details can only be known when you study a basic book on the science of Hadith. So they claim that people And the conspiracy amazingly op only happened in Persia. It didn't happen in Al Andalus. It didn't happen in North Africa. It didn't happen in India. It didn't happen in Northern uh, Ch China or Central Asia. It only had to happen in Persia. As if Muhaddisin only existed in Persia or Iraq or in that region. Or kahin se Muhaddisin nahi aai. So this is another erroneous idea they, they come up with. Then finally, next point we will address, inshallah, is a clash in some of the authentic reports. This is another idea they bring up, Hadith rejectors, that because Hadith literature is contradictory, a lot of the reports are contra in, in contradiction, so we cannot accept it, right? But they're not actually in contradiction. It is impossible for an authentic report to contradict another. It is impossible, okay? And where there is a direct contradiction, it is 
an issue to do with nasikh and mansukh which can be found in the quran if you are on if you are quran only muslims then the contradictions you are claiming in hadith also exist in the quran then be consistent then apply the sp- same criteria same standard to the quran because there are verses in the quran that apparently contradict other verses apparently apparently now those are actually not contradictions those are abrogations okay for example the quran says ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la taqrabu salah wa antum sukara yes oh you believe do not come near prayer when you are drunk then in other words allah says ya ayyuhalladhina amanu innam al-khamru wal maysaru wal ansabu wal azlamu rijsun min amali shaitan fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun ay iman walo oh you believe abstain from intoxicants gambling throwing arrows for luck okay these are actions of shaitan here wine is haram the other verse is saying do not come close to salah when you are drunk so how are you going to reconcile the reconciliation is that the first verse was revealed in the early days of islam when khamr was not made haram wine was forbidden by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gradually so the final verse abrogated all other verses now the verse oh you believe do not come near prayer when you are drunk doesn't apply it doesn't apply anymore it is abrogated it is there it is abrogated subhanallah so likewise in the hadith literature we have authentic reports abrogating other authentic reports for example Rasulullah sallam gave a ruling in the early days of Islam then later on it was abrogated where there is clay cut on the same matter issue other examples are that Rasulullah sallam gave answers to two different individuals on the same matter but the answers were different for example a man came and asked the prophet sallam about something one answer was, was given another man came another answer was given so there's contradiction right these people claim a contradiction no there's no contradiction because the people he answered to were requiring different answers for example one man came and he asked the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam for example uh you know um um uh, about fasting you know it, it had something to do with intimacy with wife can i uh be physical without being fully intimate can i be physical with my wife rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to one no you can't another man came and he asked the same question the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said yes you can okay and then hold on a second why two answers one was a young man and the danger is that when he will start a little he will go all the way it is very likely young man's passions are arisen he is intimate with his wife it starts with a with a with a with a hug or something and then while you're fasting it goes all the way right and then you broke your fast yes with an old man who is more able to possibly control his emotions and his desires it is okay for him so this is to do with circumstances it is not a contradiction it is a ruling that applies a different different ruling applies to different people right so there are many examples like that and to understand this concept imam at-tahawi the one i mentioned earlier imam at-tahawi he has written a compendium an encyclopedia on reconciliation of similar reports such reports it is called sharh mushkil al-athar okay it is a big giant book in many volumes multiple volumes it is called sharh mushkil al-athar and it is compiled by imam at-tahawi who explains that those reports that sound or seem problematic are actually not problematic it is your lack of understanding your lack of knowledge of the, of the arabic language or your lack of uh, knowledge of the history or the circumstances of these reports so imam at-tahawi he Uh, reconciles all these reports in this big compendium this encyclopedia but ask these people these hadith rejectors if they have bothered to pick up imam at-tahawi's 
reconciliations or this big giant book which was written quite early on it was rich, written in the fourth century of islam fourth century hijri so this is another uh issue last point i want to discuss today inshallah very quickly before we go to q and a because it's been very long one of the reasons to not trust hadith literature is that because it was compiled a lot later okay this is a very common uh, argument and it's a classical argument or classic argument that these rejectors present even some uh, missionaries christian missionaries come up with this idea some atheists also come up with this idea that oh why sh why should we trust hadith it was compiled so late and you guys are inconsistent you reject the gospels of jesus christ gospel of john matthew mark and luke because they were written later on okay and look at these uh, hadith uh, collections they were written a lot later than the gospels were written from jesus christ so how can you accept hadith literature and reject the gospels it's a very very valid argument to those who have no knowledge of history and theology right it is a very powerful powerful argument isn't it huh like when you actually go in depth and when you drill the argument or when you uh, dissect the argument you come to realize it is fallacious it is fallacious for example gospels were written by anonymous people they were anonymous unknown majahil they were majhul in hadith literature when a hadith comes to a muhaddis a collector of hadith for example imam bukhari or imam ahmed bin hanbal if a hadith comes from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it has been reported or it has been attributed to the prophet and one of the men in the chain is unknown for example for example the rest of the chain is known it's nafi okay we know who nafi is it's abdullah bin umar we know who abdullah bin umar is but after nafi there is a man who is not known the muhaddisin are not aware of his history his circumstances his character where he taught what kind of character personality was he such a report however beautiful it may sound however attractive the report may be okay will be thrown on the wall any hadith that has an unknown character in the chain will be thrown on the wall will not be accepted so your comparison between the gospels and the hadith literature is completely misplaced and inconsistent and non applicable why because hadith literature has been preserved from well known sources and every single man in the chain is known to us i'll give you very quick examples so when imam bukhari puts down a report in his collection that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said such and such so and so he gives his sources bukhari is almost 2 centuries apart from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right or wrong Two centuries apart, more than two centuries apart from the Prophet. So how does Bukhari know what the Prophet said? How does he know what the Prophet said or did? Right? No, Bukhari cites his sources. Bukhari tells us there are reports in Bukhari, and there are twenty-two in number. Twenty-two reports in Bukhari. They have three men between the Prophet and Bukhari. Three, three men between Bukhari and the Prophet. Bukhari narrates from his teacher. Makki ibn Abi Ibrahim, who narrates from his teacher Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid, and Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid narrates narrates from his teacher Salma ibn Al Aqwa, who was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then Salma ibn Al Aqwa narrates from the Prophet. Five men, Prophet said, Salma took it, and then gave it to Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid. When Salma was in his seventies, Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid. gave the report to makki ibn abi ibrahim when he was in his 80s okay and of sound mind and makki gave it to imam bukhari when makki was an old man so imam bukhari he took reports directly from sources who go back to the prophet uninterrupted as a chain it doesn't stop there 
There are reports in Sahih al-Bukhari that have four men between Bukhari and the Prophet. So Bukhari narrates from his teacher Abdullah bin Yusuf, who narrates from Imam, Imam Malik, Malik narrates from Nafi, Nafi narrates from Abdullah bin Umar, and Abdullah bin Umar narrates from Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then we have reports in Bukhari with five men between Bukhari and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then we have reports that have six men between Bukhari. So chains sometimes get longer depending on where the report came from or sometimes they get shorter. Okay. So every single report must come with a chain. Anything that comes without a chain will be rejected. So there is no comparison between the Gospels and the Hadith literature. Gospels are completely anonymous. We don't know who Matthew, Mark and Luke and John were. We don't know who these people were. So if we don't know who they were, why are we even believing what they're saying? Right? It is claimed that they were disciples of Jesus Christ. It is impossible to prove that. It is impossible to prove that. We call it in the science of Hadith, in Qatar, interruption of sources. Interruption of sources. We call it in the science of Hadith, in Qatar. Okay, when there is in Qatar in the chain, then that chain is completely rejected. That report is not accepted. It is daif. It is unauthentic. It is not trustworthy. We are the ones telling you that. At least study it. So, Hadith literature was first of all not written later on. It was written within the first century. Okay, there is Sahifa of Wahab bin uh, Wahab bin Manabbe. Okay, and uh, there are there are other people. Abdullah, one of the companions of Rasulullah, he was allowed to write. His name is Abdullah bin Amr bin As. He was allowed to write the Hadith of the Prophet He was an exception because Prophet did not want his companions to mix the Quran with the Hadith. So Hadith was memorized. It was internalized verbally, orally. The Quran was penned down, it was written down. Later on when the Quran was compiled in its current form by Abu Bakr and Uthman radiallahu anhum ajma'in, anhum ajma'in, uh, then the Sahaba, they started to encourage their students to write down Hadith as well. And in the time of Tabi'een, Hadith was written down and by the time we get to Imam Malik, he is already compiling Muatta Imam Malik. And we still have manuscripts of Muatta Imam Malik from his lifetime. There is a papyri manuscript which dates back to the life of Imam Malik and it is Muatta Imam Malik. Imam Malik was born in 94 Hijri when one of the companions of Rasulullah was alive, Anas bin Malik. We don't know whether Anas was alive when Malik was born, but it was the same year when Malik was born when Anas died. Radiallahu anh. It was so close and Malik is the one of the first compilers of uh, a collection of hadith. So this is enough said on this matter. The Hadith literature was compiled later on. Hence, it is not trustworthy. A lot more can be said on this topic, uh, but I do not have the time to give the details at this stage. Uh, inshallah, I'll move on. And in fact, um, uh, one last point I want to address is the issue of erroneous or um, controversial content in the Hadith literature, for example. Okay, or there are things about the prophets in Hadith literature that cannot be accepted. For example, in Bukhari, we have a report that um, Ibrahim is thought to have stated non-factual things, right? Three non-factual statements Ibrahim made, okay? There's a report in Bukhari. By the way, the term kidb, kidb in the Arabic language doesn't always mean a lie. It means a non-factual statement. For example, once Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, you know, heard Abdullah bin Umar uh, saying something about the Prophet She said, "Kadeba, Abdullah." Okay, Abdullah lied. If you translate that into English, it would be translated as Abdullah lied. But is Aisha actually saying Abdullah bin Umar is lying? Or he's a liar? No. She's saying Abdullah bin Umar is mistaken. He's stating something non-factual. 
okay she's not calling him a liar so the arabic language is very important for you to understand so when the word kidb is used in the arabic language it doesn't always mean a lie it means a lie but doesn't always mean a lie it can mean a non factual statement so when these hadith rejectors talk about uh, this hadith in bukhari or oh, ibrahim alayhi salam he had said non factual things for example he said to his people, I am sick, I cannot go with you. And then he broke the idols. And when they came back, he said, the big idol broke it, which is a non-factual statement, right? You cannot call it a lie. So, but Ibrahim Islam was deliberately making these non-factual statements to make them think, to make them think. He wasn't actually lying. And in fact, two examples are in the Quran. Two of these examples are in the Quran. So why don't you go to the Quran as well, using the same criteria? So if you attack the Hadith for some uh, controversial to you, to you, not to us, to you, some controversial content, then go to the Quran as well. There's plenty of controversy there as well. If you want to use that standard, it doesn't um, necessarily follow that uh, your argumentation is valid for Hadith literature. So they can give many more examples of intellectual impossibilities in the Hadith literature intellectual impossibilities one of those examples is prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi marrying aisha radiallahu anha now these people they think like this because they have been affected by modern liberal secular thought process they have been affected by it if you go back to history 19th century backwards 19th century backwards as i clarified most humans on the planet were getting married to girls as young as 9, 10, 11, 12, 9, 10, 11, 12, 9, 10, 11, 12. Don't believe me? Go and read a book on the age of consent written by any European scholar. Google it. Google it. Age of consent in the West before the 19th century. You will get maybe tons of articles and read the quotes of scholars and they will tell you in societies before the 19th century it was not an issue as soon as girls reach reach the age of puberty as soon as girls hit puberty which was determined by menstruation when they had their menstrual cycles they were ready for marriage they were concerned as far as those societies were concerned they were ready for marriage i'm not saying this should happen today times have changed people have changed their thinking have changed their feelings have changed People have been affected by the, uh, the, the norm that prevails in the world today. So I'm not saying that should happen today. I'm saying what happened in the past. It was the norm for them. In the past, it was the norm. As soon as a girl reached the age of puberty, when she had menses, she was ready for marriage for them in the past. Okay? So these people, these are these rejectors. They have no idea. They don't know about the history. That's why when they read that in Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu married Aisha radiallahu anha when she was nine, right? They get a shock. So if she had had her periods at that time, if she had menstruated, or if she had reached the, the marriageable age or puberty at that time, and according to their social norms, it was okay to get a girl married uh, when she reaches that age. In fact, there are reports in Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad that Abu Bakr, the father of Aisha, came to the Prophet and told him to take Aisha into your house. She's ready. Aisha is ready. My daughter is ready. Ready for what? Ready for what? She's ready to be your wife. Why? What determined that readiness? What determined that readiness? It was obviously either her menstrual cycles or her physical appearance or physical ability to them to those societies in the past it was the norm as late as the 19th century some of the american states are you listening to me brothers and, brothers and sisters as late as the 19 as late as 1920s less than a century ago less than a century ago some of the american states in the south they allowed girls to get married as young as 12 11, 12, depending on, uh, even 10, even 10, depending on which state it is. As late as the 1920s. 
So if these hadith rejectors were alive in the 1920s, they wouldn't have this. This question wouldn't be bugging their mind. So as Iqbal said, Tera wujood sarapa tajalli afrang ke tu wahan ke imarat garon ki hai tamir. Ke tu wahan ke imarat garon ki hai tamir. And I will end the lecture here today. We have finally, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, completed our treatment of hadith rejection. And hopefully people have benefited. Uh, in the future, we might do more extensive, lengthier lectures on this topic if necessary, if questions come, up, come, come across, if people are asking questions for us to uh, address then inshallah we will go further into detail but i believe anyone reasonable anyone who is uh, um, blessed with common sense and firm knowledge of history and theology and hadith literature will find these lectures convincing and will possibly uh, inshallah follow the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu if he or she is a hadith rejecter so those of you who are Hadith rejectors, whether you are subtle hadith rejectors or open hadith rejectors or partial hadith rejectors or complete hadith rejectors, this was our love for you. This is this was not a hateful exercise, rather, this was this was this was our love for you, and you should accept it as a loving gesture on our part. Jazakumullah khairan wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.